What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the I Tap That Cigar Show presented by Corona Cigars. Always, I'm your host, Kevin from Cigar Prop, and we are coming to you live from the Drew Estate Experience Asset Studios here on the sunny Gulf Coast of Florida. Normally, my co-host, Cara Viajante, would be joining us, but he is under the weather um, tonight, so hopefully he's watching uh, and he can type in his questions, which we will ask uh, um, our guest. And um, as always, joining me in the background, producer Jessica. Hello. Hello. That's uh, um, uh, she wasn't gonna put makeup on tonight just for Nick. If it had been, <laughs> if, if it had been like Steve, no, probably not no, Steve. No, I, I just I was you, not uh, putting makeup on. You'd put today. makeup on for Matt Booth. Matt, you'd put makeup on. Uh, not. Yeah, probably you will. You see the way you said that? You're, she's twirling her hair as she says that. No. And you know what happens when I girls feel, twirl, twirl listen, their hair. Off, I feel so uh, grimy yeah. after painting for two days. Yes. Trying to scrub my, my hair, my body, my face. And felt like it just needed nothing touching it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> we, so we, much if pain anybody been following us on the social media, as like I said, we, we got the, uh, the, the new lounge and our new workshop in primer and paint. Thank you, Sherwin Williams, for uh, for a great uh, a co a company, employees that you have, um, and helping me get the right primer and paint. Uh, let's get right into it. I need a cigar. So let's get right into the Cigar Medics Humidimeter Cut and Light. Remember with the Cigar Medics Humidimeter, where's my... Thank you, Gray Wolf. Where's my that. humidimeter at? <laughs> oh, there it is. Remember with the Cigar Medics Humidimeter... You'll always know when to hold them and know when to smoke them. And mine is at 62%. Absolutely perfect. So uh, we're both smoking the, the yes. Tartar Oak. And I the reason why is the only other cigar that I have is uh one that would probably kill me and kevin trapped in this little space oh you have like the, the big upsetter. the big have, upsetter you have like I a have, six by 60 upsetter i have a couple different sizes but yeah. i do enjoy that cigar but that is definitely a, an outdoor cigar i agree but, and, and if you didn't hear jessica we were both smoking the uh the charter oak habano um now uh I'm not saying this because because of the guests that we're having on the show. You can actually go back. Um, uh, I get asked this the most on TikTok, so you can go back to uh, my TikTok channel, look at any of my videos, and you'll all what you almost all the time you're going to see a question that gets asked me. What's a cigar that you would smoke as a beginner, or like like what you know? What would you recommend? 100% of the time, and that's if it's asked on any platform. I always say go to your local brick and mortar, buy all three charter oak cigars uh can i say something what if you google what's a good beginner cigar charter oak pops up in the list as as it should it's a cigar i tell everybody go to your brick and mortar buy buy the connecticut shade the, the broadleaf and the habano uh smoke all of them and then go back to your brick and mortar and have a discussion with the tobacconist because depending on what you like or or don't dislike between those three cigars, he is going to be able to get you into any cigar on the market. But hopefully he, he you know steers you into the foundation line. But like I said, the Charter Oak uh, line, 100% of the time, that is always the, the cigar I tell everybody to smoke if they're, well, and a beginner or not, I'm smoking one tonight. I'm not a beginner. No, but I would just thought that was pretty uh, cool that when you Google that, that pops up. So that must be uh, must be me. It must be all my questions. Oh, I'm, I'm doing that. It makes me feel better for uh, getting a free hat uh, from her, uh, <laughs> taking a free hat. Um, I don't even think I asked for this hat. I think I just took it. Um, so, all right. Like you. <laughs> all right. So we got a little uh, uh, housekeeping um, to, to get through before we bring on our guest. Um, we talked about it last week, and uh, we'll remind everybody again, Boston Jimmy and his son is going to be climbing Mount Fuji this July to raise money for Autism Speaks. In the show description or the podcast description, if you're listening to this, there is a link to the Autism Speaks fundraiser page where you can donate. The only thing I ask is that you put in, you can put in your name, but they'll have a name recognition box. Type in Cigar Prop. Whoever gets the most donations, um, well, if we get the most donations, Boston Jimmy has agreed to take one of our lighter bleed tools to the top of Mount Fuji with him. Uh, and then when uh, when he gets back, I'm going to au auction it off for charity. So uh, definitely check out that link. Also, 
Matt and Nicole from Smoke and Tobacco are hosting their third annual annual raffle for the Cigar Family Charitable Foundation. They've raised over fifty-eight thousand dollars to date. Um, there are tons of raffle prizes, so make sure you click that link in this video description or podcast description below. Donate today and get in on uh, uh, those those great great raffles. Jessica, anything else uh, that uh, we're uh as far okay. as news yeah uh, i forget i thought there was something um else let's see uh tune in uh we got it's just manny uh tune in tomorrow oh, night 9 there, p.m the news. That's okay the, the yes we'll, we'll uh, don't don't worry manny we'll we'll ask uh we'll, we're gonna okay so that's that's gonna be our first question for nick um so since manny's on right. um that Manny, you probably have a good chance at this one. Like there hasn't been a manufacturer yet that has watched this TV show. I have a feeling Nick, this might be up his right night. Might, might be up his alley. Um, we got Michael Scott Henry. Good evening. Just happy to see Nick on the show. I almost always go to foundation whenever I want to. I want quality enjoyment. Not sure what I'm in the mood to smoke specifically. Also great to me. Oh, Hey Marshall at, at, at the great smoke. Um, Hello. Yeah. Hello. So, all right. I think uh, let's uh, let's. Uh, all right. Enough of hearing Kevin speak. That's it. With that, care usually interrupts my speaking. Yeah. So, uh, not interrupts. He, you know. Keeps you, keeps yeah, he keeps me from talking too much. Um, so, all right. Um, before we bring on our guest tonight, we want to take a moment to thank all of our show partners for making this show happen each and every week, as they have done for the last few years. Um, we really can't do this without them. So thank you to J.C. Newman Cigars, Cigar Medics, Amendola Cigars. We are the muscle. Jake Wyatt Cigars, uh, Illusione Cigars, deep in flavor, deep in your mind. K by Karen Berger Cigars, Corona Cigar, and of course, Drew Estate and Experience Acid. It's waiting patiently in the experience acid green room is Knight Commander of the Order of the Star of Ethiopia, Nick Malillo, aka Chief of the Broadleaf, aka the founder of Foundation Cigars. Nick. Kevin, great to be here, man. I think that was the first time that someone officially used the Knight Commander title. That was great. Was, uh, you know, that's more important than just a lowly cigar maker. You know, wow. Yeah. I, I, wow. I mean, I, I mean, if you have the chance to introduce yourself as two things, which one sounds better? What do they call those post nominals? I can actually yeah. <laughs> officially use uh, Knight Commander as a, when I'm signing documents or stuff like that. It's, oh. it's uh, crazy. How yeah. cool. do, you, do you have a wax seal and everything or did you get that yet? Let me tell you, no wax seal, but I'm a big fan of the wax seal. So um, you might be seeing a little something come out this this summer. Um, oh, you might right see on. a little something special come out. Um, I'm actually hoping to do something special. And also uh, I'm working with a, a new charity for Ethiopian scholarships and education. And uh, so I, I might be coming out with something at the show to kind of go you know in that direction uh, yeah all yeah right. you, you heard it here folks it's what you that's that's why charlie monado listens to our show and uh because it's always charlie's always, all over everything yeah, charlie man. just you know just uh, dropping dropping bombs for uh for, for he, charlie he so uh, I, it. Uh, uh your first do you watch the show oak island 
Do you know of this show? You know, I've seen it a few times, and I can't. I haven't kept up with it, but I. There was a period there, I think, when it first came out that I was watching it, but I haven't. I haven't seen it in a while. Okay, so but, the thing, the things that happened in the first show, that's still happening ten years later. Like yeah. they have. <laughs> yeah. So it's just we got Manny here that always asks our guests that each week. They never, they haven't found anything, and the hole's just deeper. Uh, what What are they trying to find again? They're uh, trying to find some lost treasure. They're, they're no. trying to. They're trying to find the the possibly the Ark of the Covenant. Oh man, the, they're way off. They're, they're way, way off. off. They're Was way that Jessica? Off. I was going to say, that's not true. Many would dispute that they have found some stuff. They have found some buttons. Yeah. They, ooh. They found, yeah. They found, but there is some other historical stuff that has happened on that island. Yeah. And it it kind of goes into some of that, but they still really haven't found. Like, yeah. This is, in, uh, this is in Nova. No. Where, where yeah. Is yeah. It? Yeah. I think, it's, I think it's, yeah, just off of Nova Scotia. You know, yeah. so it's just, yeah, I've one always little... wanted to go to Nova Scotia. Uh, we got I really golden like buttons. golden, but I, we got friends yeah. that live in Nova Scotia. Um, uh, my friend Megan and uh, her husband, and yeah. it looks beautiful, but like, like it, it snows, man, bro. The snow, it's 24 it's seven lot. year round. It's, it's interesting. I forgot why they feel that the Ark of the Covenant is in Oak Island. They thought that the Knights Templar brought it there or something. Yeah, like that? They, no, they, yeah. Possibly the Knights Templar because there are some old stories about some people on the mainland seeing the white robes, the the, the cross. So yeah, and then, and then also there's a there's a, a chance it could be Blackbeard has hidden some of his treasure up there. Yeah. So, so. you know, I I. I, I, as you know, I very much am a, a scholar, uh, an amateur scholar of Ethiopian history, and their claim to possess the Ark of the Covenant is, is a rather interesting one, because I don't think people realize that no other place on the planet does a country have a an affinity and culture for the Ark of the Covenant. So every church in Ethiopia has a replica of the tablets of the Ark of the Covenant, every church. So it, every it, yeah. every single church has a replica, not of the full golden angeled Ark, that one, but they have a replica of the tablets that are usually covered. Only the high priests are able to see them and they keep them within the Holy of Holies of the church. But the church doesn't exist unless those tablets are in the church. So it's sort of like the energy source. So if those tablets are removed, the church goes with it. And I don't know of a culture on the planet that, you know, has has an affinity for the Ark of the Covenant like that. So, you know, where did that come? You know, the Ethiopians claim it comes from Menelik yeah. bringing Menelik, the ark. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, so. son, son of the Queen of Sheba and uh, um, uh, and Solomon. And, yeah. And uh, lately, I've been watching some things. I'm trying to disprove that King Solomon had ever even existed. Like, there's no historical evidence that he existed. I'm like, other than the thousands of writings, you know. So, and then there, yeah. King Solomon was really an Egyptian ruler. You know, could have been Ramses. Yeah. Whoever. Interesting. Yeah. But it's it's very tough that time period because there's still not a lot of, uh, you know, there's a, not a lot of evidence. And the Ark of the Covenant, there's not a lot of, you know, evidence from the biblical uh, writings because it's only m mentioned, you know, a certain number of times and then it disappears. And it's, yeah, it's clouded yeah. in mystery. It, it, it's called, but there is one mystery that I that I found out the other so I'm sitting in my office um Saturday night I bust out of my office door because like right on the other side of this door that I'm about touching is my bedroom <laughs> Jessica is um is is in bed watching TikTok or whatever yeah. and I I'm like freaking out I'm I'm so excited because I had learned something that I didn't I never knew before and it was a, actually a, it was a, a, an Amazon suggestion it was a a, a short a, a little book called history of ethiopia Cap a captivating guide to ethiopian history oh wow um, yeah it's only uh the it's only 100 pages this company okay. makes it this company makes a ton of books and so i i bust in like the kool-aid man and i said jessica haile selassie the 225th and last emperor of ethiopia yeah uh the king of kings do Great. you know what his name was before 
it was changed to Haile Selassie? And she goes, no. And I oh, go, yeah. it was Ross Tafari. And, and, and I ha- I literally was like, shut up. And then I started looking at. So so now, now it's at night where we're both relaxed, getting ready to go to bed. We're freaking out, looking I, up. And like, I did not know. Yeah. His name was Ross Tafari. But, but the thing yeah. I found most interesting about all of that is once you become a, a Ross Tafarian, you actually have to be accepted into the faith, kind of. Like, so tradition says. So there's different mansions of what they call them mansions of Rastafari. So there's 12 tribes. Um, oh, see, uh, I did not know that. Yeah, there's a mansion called Boba Shanti. Um, and I can't believe the last one is, is slipping me. So yeah, Haile Selassie was crowned king in 1930 and given the name Haile Selassie, which, which means power of the Holy Trinity. But his, his birth name was Tafari Makenin, which his father's name was Makenin. And the term Ras is actually like, um, like Duke or Lord in Ethiopia. There's this yes. whole other stratification of royal society in Ethiopia that goes back again to the time of Solomon and Shiva. So Ras is, is a term meaning prince, or there's different interpretations of it. Um, so he was, he was named Ras, I think at the age of, uh, I want to say around 13, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And he was uh, govern. He was the head of an area called Harar. Um, so at the early age of thirteen, he was, you know, governing a whole region of Ethiopia. And he was brought up under the king at the time, whose name was Menelik, yeah. who traces back to Menelik the first from Solomon and Sheba's son. So he was brought up. He Menelik's uh, cousin was. Haile Selassie's father. So he was brought up in the royal court. So yeah, people yeah. don't realize. I, I, I never realized that. So yeah. so how does um so and, and, and I said I haven't had a chance to get like the uh I, I want to get the same book on on Rastafari, you know, the 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 religion, their beliefs, and go, dive a little bit deeper into that. So, but uh in the meantime, maybe you can fill me in. How does Ethiopian culture and 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 the basically the worship of of Haile Selassie Rastafari make its way across the globe to Jamaica? So so you have the crowning of Rastafari in ni- November second, nineteen thirty, and there was a Jamaican gentleman by the name of Leonard Howell who is considered the first Rastafarian in about nineteen thirty one. Who you know it, you got to understand in in Jamaica at that time being ruled by England you know a long history of course of colonialism and slavery no one had ever heard of a black king before I mean it was pretty much unheard of um, so this news spread in 1930 uh, early 30s and the news spread to Jamaica and Leonard Howell sees the news and starts learning that the lineage of the Solomonic dynasty runs through Ethiopia. And they were very familiar with the Bible and Revelation. In Revelation, there's a, a passage, Revelation 5.5, 5, that before the opening of the seven seals in the, in the apocalypse, uh, there was no one worthy to open the book except for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. And this was the Ethiopian title. Haile Selassie took on this title. Haile Selassie, King of Kings, Lord of yeah. Lords. So he immediately took to Haile Selassie and denounced the Queen of England as being the true uh, queen of Jamaica and proclaimed Haile Selassie as his true king, and this caused this caused many problems. Um, and yes, and people, yeah, people didn't realize, and that's in the '30s, and it really wasn't until the '60s and '70s that people really started to learn about Rastafarians. But they had existed. Um, there was a community up in the mountains called Pinnacle, where uh, 
Leonard Howell and and many followers, you know, were, were living, and the government came in, beat everybody up, kind of dis dis you know, disembursed, you know, everybody, and was really threatened by this this kind of movement. But people saw Haile Selassie as the second coming of Jesus. Not everybody has the same interpretations. There's a lot of different interpretations, but one of them that, you know, he was the one to come and open the book and the seven seals. And he became a, a Messiah figure to many people in Jamaica. Yeah. You know, they're, and they're still fighting. I, I know, I think the uh, uh, Prince William just visited what last year or two years ago. And then Jamaica had, they, they had said, you know, Hey, you know, we're, we're done. We're done with you. And I guess they're, I, I, you know, they're yeah. still in there. They're still, uh, they're in, they haven't kicked them out yet. I don't know what's. Oh, the, the British, no, the British, are the, you know, Jamaica became independent. I want to say, uh, I, I always mix up the date. I'm sorry if I mix up the date, 1964, 63-ish. Uh, uh, but you still have a, you know, a relationship. I was there in October on a delegation with Haile Selassie's grandson. Um, I was had the honor of being part of a delegation to Jamaica in October, which was an amazing dream come true. And part of our visit was to parliament and then the governor's house, who the governor's, yeah, the king's house, I'm sorry, is is directly appointed by, you know, the queen at that time, now the king. So there's a, still a very intimate relationship, even though Jamaica is independent between Britain and, and Jamaica. The interesting thing, this gets kind of complex, is that Haile Selassie and the Queen had a very close relationship. Oh, did uh, they? Oh, very much so. Yeah, very much so. The Queen visited uh, Ethiopia many times. Uh, when the Italians invaded Ethiopia the, before World War II, the Italians invaded in 1936, um, Haile Selassie went first to Jerusalem, then to Switzerland to address the League of Nations. And then he went into exile in England, in Bath, England. Um, and then five years later, the, uh, the British actually helped the Ethiopians retake uh, Addis Ababa, the capital, and Ethiopia. Um, so, yeah, there's this interesting. Uh, many Rastafarians are not big fans of the Queen in England, but then you have many that are and understand the relationship. So, so, so what is their role? If they, I, you know, I know they're an independent nation. What is the, the the monarchy's role in Jamaica now? Because they, like I said, they were, you know, they still, are, are, you know, it's part of the. I, believe it's still part of the English Commonwealth territories. Oh, is it? Know? Okay. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they're, they're common Commonwealth still. So even though they're independent, um, I, I really don't understand. I, I, I should know more about it, but the Commonwealth, you know, to my understanding, there's still, you know, uh, some sort of basic governance and, and uh, relationship. I mean, they, they're not separated completely. I was kind of shocked to see it um, myself on my trip in October. I didn't realize how how much England is still uh, much a part of the the governing of Jamaica. Yeah, it's a, I'm 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 of Irish descent, so I'm not a fan of the English either. Just making their waves and putting yeah. their ten tentacles in everything. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, they, yeah at, at their height, man. Like I said they. They own half the planet, you know, everywhere. Yeah. And it just it's mind boggling that that such a small nation like England can have like this rule over like an island like like I, I can understand Ireland is next door. Jamaica yeah. is across the ocean. It's like how did they keep that, you know, so long and you know, well and among yeah, other, and this, other the Spanish had it, I think, before the English, right? I mean, yeah, this this uh this battle over the Caribbean and Spain, you know, Spain, Portuguese. Um, I believe Jamaica, if you see the Jamaican flag to some of my research is actually the crest of Columbus's, um, Columbus's family and what, oh, he, really? what he flew under. Yeah. So a lot of these things, you know, they're still very much interconnected, uh, that's that's what is so fascinating to me about history, and I've always 
been into history because it, it just sort of connects the dots a lot of times and explains why a lot of things are the way they are. And when I was, oh younger, yeah, and, and yeah. plus you, you have knowledge on practical history, um, not like uh, um, Terence Riley of Agonorsa who studied like ancient Rome and like Greek or whatever. And it's like, what is, what are you gonna do with that, Terence? You know, now, now you're in the cigar I business. Mean, so yeah. That 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 history is interesting also because it really does stem uh, way back to that that time. I mean, you look at the architecture, you know, law and stuff like that. But it's not my strong point uh, going yeah, back no, that far. Yeah, no, no, not not at all. Now, are you Rastafarian, or do you are you practicing, or are you? It's that's an it, that's a great question. I never really talked about that before. Um, it, I, I closely re relate with Rasta, Rastafari because it's if you talk to Rastafarians, it's not a religion per se, but a way of life. They call, it's yeah. called liberty. Um, so it's a way you live your life. And I, I definitely connect to it. Um, and I, I, I closely relate to, I think, Christian and, and Rastafarian um, if I had to put a name on it. But I was never really into the namings of, of religion in per se because it didn't make sense to me at a very young age why all these people are talking about God and everybody's fighting against each other. Right. And, you know, one of the teachings of Haile Selassie was about the unification of the churches, but also of religion, you know, and and respecting other people's you know, uh, religious beliefs and, and spirituality, which I connected to. Uh, so I, I would closely relate uh, to the Rastafarian faith. Yes. All right. So, so, did, you know, uh, obviously your, your, your love of the Jamaican culture, I said it, it's evident in, in the, in the cigars, the upsetters. Um, but um, did your love of Jamaican culture bring you to Ethiopia or did your, fascination with Ethiopia bring you to the Jamaican cultures? Where, where did that start? Yeah. So it, it's interesting because it really closely connects to my life in, in cigars. So it, it was all my life in cigars was happening simultaneously with my love for, you, you know, Jamaica, Rastafari and, and Ethiopia. So 95, 96, you know, I started smoking, um, a lot of cigars that were made in Jamaica. And one thing people don't realize being from Connecticut is Connecticut actually has the third largest population of Jamaicans in the United States. So it's Miami, New York, and Connecticut, which is bizarre, in, in, right? In, in Connecticut. Okay. Just, and, yeah. and you want to know why that is? That is yeah. directly related to a 1944 work program between the state of Connecticut and Jamaica. So uh, World War II is, is happening. There is a huge demand for cigars in uh, for the soldiers. I have letters from my grandfather who fought in the Battle of the Bulge requesting his Connecticut cigars. There was no one to work the fields. Okay. So Connecticut went to Jamaica, who was also producing uh, amazing cigar, Royal Jamaica, which uh, Churchill was an avid smoker. Of, so that's where that relationship happens. My new office, uh, which we're going to be announcing probably over the next couple of months, is actually an old Jamaican barracks um, on a on a hundred acre farm in the valley where Jamaicans would actually live, and they come up for the the summer, the growing season between April and and September, October, and then return to Jamaica for the growing season there so i'm learning about this as i'm smoking cigars and you know connecticut when you're young you're like oh man i gotta get out of here Connecticut <laughs> sucks but one of the coolest things about connecticut at the time was you know learning about our history of cigar culture so you know 96 i graduated high school i'm looking for a job i'm smoking you know, at this time, Macanudo Hyde Park was being made in the C. Fuentes factory in Kingston, Jamaica. It was using Connecticut shade wrapper from the valley, and it was no cellophane. In it was an amazing cigar. 
Temple Hall, amazing, Royal Jamaica. So simultaneously, some of my good friends in school started listening to ska and rock steady music, mm -hmm. which is distinctly, you know, Jamaican music. So I started getting, you know, into the music that summer. As I'm working, you know, I start working the cigar store in August. And then I was introduced to Bob Marley and it was, it was over after that. I mean, I started listening to Bob, but you know, where people were just listening to Bob, I didn't smoke, you know, herb at that time. Yeah. And everybody was just, everybody had a, a poster of Bob Marley yeah. and I'm listening to, you know, jamming in the name of the Lord where jam all these songs, what is this man saying? And I, I deep dove into, you know, Bob's, Bob's music and, you know, Bob, Bob's whole mission was to spread the word of Ethiopia and Haile Selassie. I mean, that was, he dedicated his life to it and almost died, died for it. Uh, so that's kind of where it started and it never stopped from that point, you know? And you were and lucky then, enough, uh, uh, you, you were at Bob's house, um, uh, wasn't it, on uh, uh, the anniversary of his, or his birthday? What, I saw him, yeah. I remember, I remember a yeah. long time ago, uh, what was that, it been a couple of years now? So that was um, February 6th, uh, 2015. Yeah, oh, it was, was it? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it was 2015. Uh, it was, I was here in, in Nicaragua working on El Wawense, which was going to launch at the show that July. And stressing out and happened to go on, you know, online and, and remembered that it was Bob's 70th birthday. This was like five days before I booked a last second ticket to Kingston, had no idea what was going on. I just showed up at Bob's house at, uh, February 6th. And of course they had stages set up. Oh uh, yeah. Drumming going on for the morning time. So I had been there before 56 Hope Road is the name of Bob's house. Oh, and, wow. <laughs> which is now a, a museum and a, a, one of the, the hot spots in, in Kingston to visit. Uh, people get a little nervous about Kingston, but uh, Bob's house is a, is a place of refuge. It's definitely. a place of, you know, we got Christopher Walmer, uh, first song I learned on the ukulele redemption song intro. Oh, nice. And, yeah. Uh, That's a you, good one. That's it. You play. Well, what do you play? The uh, uh, the the banjo, don't don't you? No, no, no. no. That was I was fooling around. I play a little oh. guitar, but nothing nothing too crazy. I mean, I I I just play around with it. I it's my dream to really actually learn piano and 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 to learn music more. But I fool around with the guitar. I have a guitar here in the studio. Okay, I mean, so I, I've, I've studio. never seen you. Don't you have like a no, foundation that was, cigar? That was, uh, yeah, some, uh, the humidor shop in Maryland, who I've known forever, uh, it, it was a gift. This beautiful oh, banjo okay. with found, uh, foundation logo. Yeah. The base of the banjo. And we, I, I faked that whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> they played that song in the background and I, I, I faked the whole thing. Is that what it was? I'm like, I'm yeah. like, I'm, for someone that not know, I'm like, you did pretty good. I, I actually did a video uh, years ago, Jessica and I, and uh, I have a set of like, uh, like cheap bagpipes, like really cheap oh, bagpipes. Yeah. And we were doing a, a video for, um, uh, I forget what, garbage cigar it was uh you know it was uh and it was like an ir uh um an irish themed cigar a, a flavored know. cigar whatever and i had my kilt on and i came in seeing play in the back and then, uh, then jessica shuts the phone off that was playing it so yeah <laughs> same thing but uh but yeah you had a milli milli vanilli moment yeah, yeah. that's it yeah i i, I love the other uh, the meme that's going around milli vanilli watching everybody uh lip sync on tiktok and becoming millionaires and they're just Imagine. like what what the fuck is this these poor yeah. guys man that's they it. So we, destroyed we, they yeah, did they we got uh ronnie haitia joining us tonight uh do you know ronnie from secreto cigar in uh secreto, Ferndale, michigan yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I know of him. I don't know if I met Ronnie before in person. Have I, Ronnie? You would know. Nobody forgets Ronnie. That's like saying, uh, that's like saying, hey, um, I can't remember. Have I ever met Steve Saka? No. <laughs> if you if you ask yourself that question, no, you have not met Saka. You have not met uh, Ronnie at all if you haven't. Uh, um, How's my light situation doing? Should I? I uh, 
No, I mean you're. Right. You, you, I mean, yeah, you're you're lit up just yeah, you're lit right. up just right, just just fine. All right, good. So so all right, I introduced you as Knight Commander of the Order of the Star of Ethiopia. Tell I I've never I've never heard the story about I I know you've talked a little bit about it online you know like on your own personal Facebook page but how did that come like what does that title mean and how did you get that like what does it take it's I'm still uh, in shock about the whole thing to be honest but uh, it was before COVID hit it was February it was actually the leap day 29th. Uh, I had gotten an email that month inviting me to a dinner in Washington, D.C. Um, with the Ethiopian Crown Council. And I don't know, at the time, I didn't know how I got it or, you know, where, how I just received this invitation and, of course, uh, agreed to go to the dinner. And then they had asked me if I would provide Menelik cigars for the dinner. Of course, I, I happily agreed. Okay, so and you're already you're already making the Menelik at the time. Okay, correct, correct. So then I learned you going to the dinner. I met the the woman who had actually sent me the invitation, and she said, uh, "Well, we had seen the, your box of Menelik's in TG Cigar Shop in Washington D.C. TG's is a great." a shop in DC, not too far from the white house. And it's a bar. And, um, I had remembered talking to the owner about four years prior to that three or four years prior. And a friend of mine from Connecticut was in the shop and said, uh, I, I think the owner is from Ethiopia. At which point I said, pass the phone. Let me talk to her. We talked for about a half an hour. And that was it. That was the, that I hadn't talked to her since. And we had never met in person. But part of the Crown Council happened to be in the shop and she, the owner said, you have to contact Nicholas. He, he, he loves Ethiopia and the history. So that's how I had gotten the invitation. And I showed up to the dinner and I was texting TG as, as I'm at the dinner, not knowing she was sitting right across from me. <laughs> So we instantly made a, made a ruckus in the middle of this black tie, tie dinner. And that's how the invitation started. And I met some really amazing people at the dinner. Uh, one of them was, is a professor of antiquities at, at Fairfield University. One of the other gentlemen was actually, uh, his family was, his father was the goldsmith to Emperor Haile Selassie. And it was just mind blowing. And I, I became friends with a number of people I met that evening and then COVID hit and we ended up uh, doing a lot of Zoom calls. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I, I think I was being vetted. Like, oh, you okay. know, why, why is this, you know, who is this guy and why does he have such a love for, for Ethiopia and some of the, the, people I'd become friends with were really close to Prince Hermias uh, Sela Selassie, who is, is Haile Selassie's grandson. And I think they just went back to him and said, uh, you know, no, I think this guy just really loves Ethiopia. And, uh, you know, he, he, he genuinely loves Ethiopia. And, um, you know, I started uh, becoming closer to some of the, the members and, uh, I ended up going to a couple other events, and then last year I was uh, I received the order of uh, the night the or order of the Star of Honor of Ethiopia in the rank of Knight Commander for my uh, promotion and support of the Crown. How, Which how, is, how cool. So, so what is, what does that get you in Ethiopia when you visit Ethiopia? What does, I mean, do you have like, um, I don't want to say like a, a, a uniform or I don't want to say a sash with a giant key to the city, but you know, but what is that, you know, do you get so something? In, in, well, yeah, yeah. So I was knighted at the dinner last year, formally knighted uh, in a ceremony and I was given the, Order of Knight Commander, which goes back to the late 1800s, 
and the time of Menelik. Um, I believe it was Menelik who formed the order. Um, I don't know if you saw, did you see the, uh, the, the night commander piece? I don't know if I can bring this up for you there. Let's see. This is what uh, I was honored with here. This is. Oh, the, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's the, the order in the night commander. And there's also a miniature. And I always knew I would get a gold star, you know, <laughs> I got one in kindergarten. And, um, uh, so yeah, I, I received these amazing, um, medal, um, yeah, which goes I, back, yeah, to the late 1800s. I mean, how cool, but I can understand them vet. I mean, we've got this, this, this white guy from Connecticut, you know, that is for some reason, you know, enthralled in, in our culture. Let's dig a little bit, you know, yeah. let's just dig a little deeper, you know, because, you know, like I said, I, 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 reading in this book, you know, uh, Ethiopia, you know, not a lot of fans back in the day, you know, uh, I, I love the story how they crushed an entire Egyptian, I mean, decimated and, and, and a, the, the entire country of Egypt, the entire army. I loved that story. That you was know? a, that was a while ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, that was, that was a yeah. while ago. That was, that yeah. was a while ago, but it was still, still a cool story. But yeah. So people have been yeah, trying it, to in, infiltrate. I, you know, I, when, when I was 18, all I knew of Ethiopia was starvation. You know yeah, that, we, we, we grew yeah, yeah, up yeah. in the time of live aid. So yeah, Live that, that, Aid that's in, it. in 1984, 86, the communists took over in 1974. They called themselves the Derg. Yep. So Haile Selassie was responsible. He was known as the emperor of education. He built a ton of universities and was very adamant about Ethiopians studying abroad, learning from other cultures. So uh, 1974, the Russians and the Cubans penetrated the universities and it started this period of history known as the red terror in Ethiopia because they systematically murdered uh, much of the Royal family and anyone that was speaking out against them. And then that led into the early 1980s where there was massive famines in the country and then live aid and live aid, you know, they say the road of uh, to hell is paved with good intentions Oh yeah. yeah, it was a very controversial uh, concert that was global. Anybody that was around this time, I was, you know, maybe six years old. But at, at the same time, it was trying to do so much good to raise money for this the famines. Um, it branded the country as starvation, and yeah. that's literally all I knew until you know I was eighteen. And then there, I had a few different experiences that were, were happening. I was reading the Bible in university. The English professor had us reading Genesis as literature, not as a religious text. Yeah. And it very clearly in Genesis 2.13 describes the Garden of Eden as having four rivers. Tigris, Euphrates, which we know is Mesopotamia, Iraq. And the two other rivers were the Gihon and the Fihon, which the Bible says flew through the land of Ethiopia, or some Bibles say Kush. Ethiopia is Greek. Kush is Hebrew. They both mean the same thing, those who have been darkened by the sun. So that's happening. And then I had a customer that came in with an, in the cigar shop with a National Geographic that talks about all of the first bones of Homo sapiens being found in Ethiopia. Yeah, Not only that, Lu Lu Lucy, the Australian Lucy. Pithecus, you know, all of them has been in the Rift Valley. So I'm like, what? How is a religious text? There's a bib biblical text, and the scientists are set, like, that's weird. How? Why is that? And I just started really connecting the dots, and then learning pre 1974, you have three thousand years of kings and queens. That is one of the oldest lineages of kings and queens in the world and that just blew my mind you know that that but not only that is that we now years later they had the genome project which everybody's getting their dna done yeah, yeah. but they traced mitochondrial dna so everybody's mother's dna doesn't matter what color you are what race you come from 
anywhere on the planet, they traced it back to one female in Ethiopia. So we have fossil evidence, we have DNA evidence, we have religious, you know, so we have one common origin of humanity, but this is pretty much unknown. You know, we, we, we do not, I mean, it's not taught in school. It's not, you know, it, it, really it, it, talked it's, about it's at all. It's not because, I, you know, because we're about the same age. Like I said, I grew up, that's all I knew about Ethiopia famine. You know, you had mm-hmm. the, the Ethiopian well, you had jokes. All commercials you had all the commercials, kid. you know. And, 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 yeah. and, and literally it would like break your heart. It, it, it is. And then, and then Live yeah. Aid, which, which none of that money ever went to Ethiopia. That, all that did was that went straight the to Congress. the government. The communists you know, took all the money, t- t- which is crazy the- that they, you know, the all the England, United States, all these governments supported that this happened because, yeah, the majority of it did not get back to the people. Oh, exactly. And then yeah. for, for me, after that, Ethiopian culture really, you know, we, we didn't learn about anything in Ethiopian school. I mean, that, that was something that was never taught. And uh, honestly, until I found Foundation Cigars. Like years ago, like I, which never, you know, brought Ethiopian culture back into my forefront. You know, I, I remember, I think it was 2020 or I think it was 2020 or 2021. You know, the uh, the Havana Seed Connecticut 142. That was my number one cigar of the year. I remember buying that box and um, remember yeah. seeing like, like wanting to know more about the person that was on the cover of, yeah. of, the, of that box. And then really diving deep into the, uh, uh, the, the culture and the heritage. And I'm like, this is, this is the cradle of civilization. You know, exactly. you, you can call it, I, you know, I say Iraq, but, uh, but no, it really is Ethiopia. Yeah. And then, and then since then for the last couple of years, I've just been on a, a mission just to find out as much information as I can. Same. I'm always, it just never, never stopped because it, it really changed my perspective on everything. So I, I suddenly, you know, at that age, you know, I was 18 at the time, I, I started seeing things not as separated and everything being very interconnected, um, if that makes sense. Like oh, that, uh, it, and then it opened up this door to, to learn, you know, I, I ended up learning more out of university than I did in university because I was on that, this kind of road of discovery. And I just found it mind blowing that I could have a perception of a place and it be so actually rich in so much history and culture and, and be part of the beginning of, 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 you know, human history. That's it. We got, we got Ronnie from Secreto. That's, that's an opinion where, where civilization started. So Ronnie Haysha. So, so he's the, uh, Ronnie, what, 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 what? I forget. He's not Sumerian. He's, uh, but yeah, his his people are the first people. So, uh, the, the, uh, so Ronnie takes. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, Mesopotamia yeah. is a very important place. But to my my feeling is is that Mesopotamia, that you know, it's it's known five thousand years ago. Mesopotamia, Sumer, you yeah. know, civilization begins on these amazing cuneiforms. Cunif- uniforms yeah, oh, yeah. He, babylonian so yeah yeah so. i i have a feeling although i do not have you know uh firm credible evidence that civilization goes back much farther than we originally anticipated and if you see this area of the world between tigris euphrates you know the gihan fihan ethiopia the blue nile starts there so that's one of the tributaries of the Nile River. And then you have the Red Sea. This, that Red Sea at the end of the, at the last ice age, this was one land mass. There wasn't that huge, that, that sea didn't fill in until after the ice caps melted. Yeah. So this was, this was a really interconnected region. Um, but Ronnie is, is correct. I mean, in the time of Abraham, yes, yeah, you know, and, uh, and, I, I and then, yeah, and then we don't know how much further back they go. You know, there's proof now that you know uh, what, which have been reading a lot on like the Sphinx, you know, is fifteen thousand years older than what they thought it was. You know, so where did civilization actually begin? And you know, it's just been it. Well, that opens up the, the you know the the Sphinx, 
the geologists have, uh, many geologists have claimed that the Sphinx is actually water erosion due on the Sphinx and not wind, wind and sand. And that brings the date back to the Sphinx to be much older. Um, there, you know, there's places in Turkey now, there's a place um, that they discovered that they're dating to 12,000 BC. Um, yeah. Yeah. That is kind of changing you know, all the perception. I, it it uh, is. I, I think in the next, we don't ten, know ten much. Years, man. Yeah. We don't, I mean, we don't, we don't know anything. I mean, we have yeah. such our knowledge of, of our ancestry and, and our, and our civilization is so tiny. Um, it, it's, it's crazy. Um, and it's, I mean, they, it, didn't, they didn't know the earth was, <laughs> you know, 4 billion years old until like 1952. I mean, we're, and now the stuff, you see all the stuff in the Amazon now, yeah, it, it, it's it discovered insane. all of these. Uh, I mean, it's insane, but it, it, we, it, we do it, not know the whole story. I mean, it, it's, it, it, it's crazy. I mean, when, when you think about like Albert Einstein, who who is, uh, I mean, he's from our, you know, well, I mean, not our generation, but essentially our generation. He didn't know there were dinosaurs. Like, okay. Like, like so, and, and like we just discovered, and then I, I, I read an uh, interesting fact uh, uh, last week that, you know, talking about like how old dinosaurs were there were dinosaur um you know boat you know um um when dinosaurs were still alive so the, yeah. at the end of dinosaurs, 250 million yeah, years there, there were dinosaur fossils that were hundreds of millions of years old while dinosaurs still roam the planet you know right. and th and then like i said we didn't find we didn't find out about dinosaurs until like what the 60s or something whatever it was it's like what Big reptile, big reptiles. Big, 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 big reptiles. I think that's what dinosaur means. Gigantic yeah. reptile. Or yeah, something gigantic like that. or angry lizard. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think that's what's important is like you know nothing is written in stone when it comes to this. I'm you know always open to learning and you know I think it's unfortunately people get really attached and especially in academia and they become you know really closed down to discovery and and learning new things um i don't know if you saw recently in the the great pyramid they actually discovered a new chamber within yes. the pyramid which is which is interesting but you know people have narratives and they're trying to come across with a certain narrative a lot of the time but that's it i mean they're, they're trying to prove that the great pyramid wasn't khufu's it was uh you know that was just uh you know that one dude that scribbled it on the wall to to make some sense of you know who, whose pyramid it was you yeah, know, or Khufu or Ramses, one one of the one of the two, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean that, that, that I could be older than yeah. the timeline is kind of weird, you know. We, we the Homo sapien timeline is about two hundred fifty thousand years yeah. that we emerged from the Rift Valley, right? Yeah. From the, from this from this area, so you basically have this linear accepted uh, uh, line of civilization that we were basically hunter gatherers until Sumer and and Mesopotamia. So until 5,000 BC. So it went 250,000 years and it wasn't until 5,000, you know, BC that civilization emerged. Well, that's it. You know, uh, we, we were just watching something the other night on the History Channel and God, I can't remember the name of the civilization. I want to say it's in South America, but it was, you know, they, they have dated it back to 12 to 15,000 years ago when we were still hunter-gatherers. I mean, we had nothing. We had sticks. That's all we had. And they built like these, these, uh, you know, with what they think were shrines with these stones that are, you know, tens of tons. And like how we had sticks. I mean, we can, we can prove this. We had no tools at this time, period. It wasn't a thing. How did they construct these? You know, can't explain it. it. They can't you, explain it. I mean, you, yeah aliens it's always always coming back uh, you to know i mean that's that you, then you get into sumir yeah which which you know i, I i'm curious if, if ronnie knows this the story of of the anunnaki but uh, according to the yeah Sum sumerian tablets is that they they were very much aware of the solar system and planets and that there was another planet which NASA is now confirming, which is crazy.
There's yeah. always been the conspiracy of Planet X. Of Nibiru, yeah. They call it Nibiru, of yep. another planet. And this has always been rejected as a crazy conspiracy theory. But they have now have the mathematical data that they actually, NASA is converting. You look at, I was in this wormhole about two weeks I, ago. I, I, I was a couple of months ago when they were talking yeah. about, you know, how they put the planets into this computer system. And it's mm -hmm. like, without the, without this planet, it, it, it couldn't, it, the, we, we, it, the things go. couldn't have formed. Yeah, so, it was on uh, 60 minutes or something you know, like that. They you know, did so yeah, so, so, so they put it out there and then everything fell in line. Like it's yeah. exactly where, you know, there's one, one, a uh, group of, uh, um, planetary scientists or whatever that due to math, they, they figured out on math on a whiteboard. Okay. If this planet is there, like in this region of space, we're expected to see this, this, and this. that's exactly and they, it. And they, and they spent like whatever, a couple of years and they found it exactly yep. what they, they, I mean, it was just the math found this place it fits in into the ma the mathematical uh, mathematical uh, model. I mean, it's the only explanation for the math to the mathematics is that there's it. another planet. Yeah, but the Sumerians. Sumerian. <laughs> yeah, the original stargazers. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, Ronnie. That's where these. I mean, Ronnie. I think claimed that Turkey was a part of this area also, but this area in in Turkey now that they've dated. 12,500 years uh, that was buried, purposely buried. Yeah. Uh, I can't believe I forgot the name of it. Um, do, we, do, we, do you mind if I pull this up? Yeah, for a yeah, no, I got to no. get the. Uh, yeah, I, I, think we're, I think we're talking about the same place. Um, I thought Here's, it was South oh. America. Um, yeah, go, go, ble, go, black, go, 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 black, go, black, go, Yeah, go, black, or go, black, Yes, that's, and, that's the, that's what I was thinking of. The they 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 have now claimed that this was purposely buried, but that the objects and structures are mathematically aligned with the stars, right? And this is what it kind of comes down to is you know, we're inside all the time, we're on TV, you know, TVs, we're not connected to the movement of the heavens. And these ancient cultures, of course, would have to be connected in a very intimate way with the heavens in order to live and survive. I mean, it's, it's just how it went down. So, I mean, this site 12,500 years ago, you know, changes pretty much all the history books it, it, and, it, and brings it back much farther. It, so. it does. You know, and speaking of cool sites, uh, you got a visit on your last, uh, one of your last trips to Ethiopia, um, uh, St. George's Cathedral. You know, you know, and you and you got to see all the cool stuff that was in there. How cool was that? And for people that don't know, this uh, St. George's Cathedral, that's where uh, uh, Haile Selassie was crowned. Yeah. Um, and then and I, I happened to be there on November 2nd, which was the anniversary of his coronation. Oh, was that planned and or you just happened to no, be? No, I, I mean, when November 2nd came, I said I have to be here while I was there. But the, the Ethiopia trip happened last minute that was my first trip to ethiopia oh, that was your first okay first trip and i always of course dreamed of traveling to ethiopia and i never thought in my wildest imagination that it would manifest traveling there with haile selassie's grandson and uh, a delegation oh, i was okay. honored to be part of the ethiopian delegation as the only foreigner a part of the delegation people don't realize is Haile Selassie always had ad advisors from the United States. So when he spoke before the League of Nations uh, in 1936, you know, he was very much about perspective and, you know, learning again from, from, from others. So it was, in, you know, cool that I was able to be a part of it, but it, it evolved out of our delegation to Jamaica. Um, I received a call in October asking if I would be part of the delegation because the Minister of Culture of Jamaica invited uh, Prince Hermias to Jamaica for the 60th anniversary of the independence from Britain. So we had an amazing schedule all week. We, we, we were visiting, you know, all parts of Rastafarian communities, parliament, 
it was amazing. In about two days before the trip ended, uh, Prince Hermias had gotten a call from Ethiopia that his grandfather was going to be recognized by the Organization of African Unity, which his grandfather helped form in 1963. And this was the first time he was going to be recognized since 1974. Oh, so wow. th things have been a little delicate since 1974. Uh, and it was the first time that Haile Selassie was going to be recognized. And this was on a Friday. And I was presented with, uh, you know, going on the trip. And I immediately said, yes, of course. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and he said, the one catch is we got to leave Wednesday. So this was on Friday. We left Jamaica on Saturday, got home Sunday, sent my visa on Monday to get my passport done. And we were off on, on Wednesday. So it all happened really fast. And it was amazing. Yeah. So, you, know, you know, you're talking about since the 70s, you know, Ethiopia has been a little up and down. The last couple of years have been like the last two years. It's been kind of a whirlwind, a lot of, uh, you know, political strife, you know, um, it's Ethiopia's had a lot. Ethiopia, unfortunately, had been in a kind of a civil war. Um, so communists take over in 1974. They fall out of power in 1990, 1991. Um, and then that uh, political group, they were known as the TPLF, uh, which was the Tigrayan Liberation Party. The Tigrayans is a uh, ethnic group within Ethiopia that's 6% of the population that uh, live in the north of Ethiopia. They ruled from 1990 until about 2018 when a new prime minister came in. He actually won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2018. Oh, I didn't know that. But then in 2020, when COVID hit, there was supposed to be elections. The elections were delayed. I, yeah, I, I remember then, that. Yeah. Then it got real. Unfortunately, it got really bad. When we were there in October, they were actually in peace talks and finally made peace. Oh, in okay. South Africa, while we were there, which was amazing. But there's been there's been some tensions uh, recently. It's interesting because us as the United States have finally been taking more of an interest. Um, you know, Haile Selassie was very close to John F. Kennedy. He was actually one of the four heads of state that was at his cat at the head of his casket, uh, oh, wow. chosen by Jackie Onassis. He was actually in. Washington, D.C., the month before JFK was assassinated. You know, you see the picture. My, my grandparents knew of Haile Selassie. If you see pictures from the United States of Haile Selassie, there was huge parades in the street. New York City, people lining the streets, Washington, D.C., because Haile Selassie was the first one to stand up against the fascists yeah. and, and Mussolini, and which is interesting because my family's Italian, but my grandfather's all fought of course, for the United States against yeah. the, the fascists. Um, so um, I don't know. I was going off on a tangent. You know, there, but, 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 but it's weird. Yeah. So with, within just a generation, you know, his name Crazy. and the culture was scrubbed from our history books. Except for the Rastafarians. Yeah, except for the, the, you know, the, the spirit. The, if it wasn't for the Rastafarians, it would be even less known than it is now. And even then, I think a lot of people have a, 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 a kind of not so clear picture because the culture of kind of smoking weed and all that yeah, has yeah. kind of eclipsed a lot of times the history and meaning of Ethiopia. But it, it's interesting now because the United States is taking uh, more of an active interest in uh, um, Africa because of the Chinese influence on the continent. So yeah. if you've seen over the past year, there's been numerous delegations from the U.S. And we're really looking now to Africa for, you know, investment, development, um, you know, especially in Ethiopia. We were coming out of, you know, Vietnam in the early 70s. So, you know, the communists get into Ethiopia in 74. So there was, you know, we pretty much, you know, broke all ties and... That's when it all went awry. 
So yeah, you know, and I know we're trying to block the Chinese because they're they're snatching up all the uh, um, the mineral rights. You know, they they they've got Afghanistan locked down for the cobalt, the lithium, and everything else. Ethiopia, yeah. Ethiopia's got a lot of you know a lot of natural lot minerals, of but yeah, but 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 they don't have the the infrastructure to get this stuff out of the ground. So yeah, so like, like you said, I know the the U.S. has been like, hey, this is one country that we're not going to let the Chinese get in and get you know get lock lock up before you know. Yeah. So so ha have you been back since? No, no, I haven't. So October was 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 my trip so i i'd love to love to return so so uh, what, what do you so so what, what are you gonna see are, are you are you gonna go to the church of mary of zion in axum are you gonna you, that's you, my dream is is to travel up north at the time we couldn't because of uh security concerns but yeah um lalibela which is a, a very famous place within ethiopia that has some very famous rock hewn churches that are actually carved down into the rock yeah um, so the churches are built down um which was built by one of the emperors um uh, who had uh, i think had lived in or studied in in jerusalem um i want to say 12 1400s around there so he kind of built lalibela to mimic um jerusalem uh there's gondar which is a very yeah. infamous place which was once the capital um but oxum in the north is saint mary's of zion now, where do, do, you think, claim, do you yeah. think your star is gonna get you no you, you know not even the emperors were allowed in no I, well at least to yeah. talk because because you get to talk yeah. with the uh the, the keeper you know yeah, like he, he, do, he does he does come out and like said you know if you're there he will talk to you you know I, so, i've seen some uh some interviews Yes. Um, yeah. I think, uh, uh, you know, Graham Hancock, who, who have you ever heard of Graham Hancock? Why is that name? Uh, name sounds familiar. He's, he study he, he studies ancient mysteries, but he has a famous book called fingerprints of the gods. Yes. Yes. Well we, we were, yeah. we were, that's what we yeah. were watching that interview with him. Uh, yeah. I do, I do want to know, does it Nick have a tattoo in Chinese right, right above his butt? <laughs> that's, that's a negative. That's a negative. That's a negative. So yeah, so Let me we check. unless yeah. I unless somebody got me. Yeah. So yeah, but we did see that interview. But yeah, I think that star would at least get you talking with with the the, the keeper. And um, now I remember. I don't know if this is true. Are they? I know. Uh, uh like that. And that. And for people that don't know, the the Church of Mary of Zion and Axum, that's where supposedly the the Ark of the Covenant is being held. Um, it was in a church next door. You know, they moved it to the uh, to the new church because the the powers of the the ark was actually deteriorating the building. So they moved it. Now, are are they moving it? They're moving it again. Am I correct? N not that I know of. They might be. I, I I heard that there was reconstruction of some of the building that was it was being renovated, um, but the outside. But no one is allowed in to the Holy of Holies where the, the Ark is kept. It's only, is only allowed one priest and he right. does not leave the premises his whole life. Right. And, so and, they, he, and they don't live very long. Like I, as in, according you know, to many that they, they have issues and many of them have been known to have cataracts or, um, and to have uh, cancer. And, you know, some speculate that it's because of some sort of radioactive uh, happenings going on with the ark, but that priest appoints another priest upon his passing, you know, and then that person is the only one allowed to yeah to we, keep the ark. We, we watched a couple episodes on it, but there was I can't even remember what show it was, but the one guy who's like doing commentary is like, I don't understand why nobody just jumps that little piddly fence that they got around. Yeah, and, ju and just and just bust in. And but yeah, like yeah, I'm pretty sure you would die. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. There's, it's yeah, that would be interesting. But there is, it's a heavily armed community. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, That's um, why every, I'm like, oh my god, everybody's got AK-47s. Um, you know, especially because the TPLF also controlled that that region so everybody is heavily armed but you know that is there, there's a you know a huge reference for the ark right again you know every church 
has a replica and you know this is this this is deep within the, the culture of Ethiopia that goes back you know I'm trying currently trying to research how far back the history of tablets the ta the tab uh, tablets so the this culture of every church having a replica yeah. and it you know it it goes back from my reading so far to you know before the fourth century um and and before you know before ethiopia became uh christian of course so it's it's really interesting i mean you would imagine that you know again the story is that the ark was smuggled out of jerusalem by menelik um, what, what or was or was it given to him? you know that's the thing was it smuggled? so that was that, it yeah well, Solomon w was noted. There's a very famous text called the Kebra Nagast, which is uh, the story of how the Ark got to Ethiopia. And the story goes that, you know, it was because it was God's will that Solomon, you know, accepted that Menelik, you know, take the Ark back to the land of his mother and to be protected. But at that time, it was snuck out so nobody you know you can imagine that it was kept very much uh, a, a, a secret um for a, a while before you know maybe there was hushes or rumors of you know a certain priesthood having it yeah um, and then from that evolved this culture of every church having you know when they converted to Christianity and, you know, Ethiopia is one of the oldest Christian countries in the world. Um, What's interesting too, is though, obviously most, uh, you know, cultures are going to have like sort of keepers of their history and their beliefs. Right. And then right. you throw your own propaganda out there to push people to think one way when it's really over this way type thing. I mean, that's yeah. happened forever. Yes. Some some argue that it was also the replicas were made so no one could get the real one. So yeah. it would you know, a bait and switch. And that was also the I think what was used when the Italians invaded, um, also that, you know. And it's a very difficult land to traverse. Um one of the most interesting things about Ethiopia that I didn't realize until I was there. I mean, I had read about it, but the, the weather, because you're in the highlands where the capital is, I mean, it was, we were coming from Kingston and it was, we, you know, we're in suits every day, <laughs> suits and ties. It's 90 degrees and the humidity is, you can cut it with a, with a knife. And then landing in Ethiopia was so refreshing because it was, you know, it was like maybe the high was 70. Oh, and really at, at, yeah at, and at night it was so fresh it totally changed my whole experience and perception of the country because at night it was oh it was awesome because i i like that you know 70s is perfect you know it might get up into the 80s in some places but at night it's so cool and fresh and you know you need a long sleeve and a and a and a jacket so it's uh you're in the highlands you know you're in the mountains um, I think the eastern part of the country it gets to the lowlands, but that's where the kind of the Rift Valley is. Yeah, right. That's where it's sort of like the Rift Valley is almost like tearing apart like a zipper, whereas as like the um, you know in India the Himalayas they form yeah. the continent merge. These They're are like tearing. tearing tearing apart, and the western part is going up into the highlands. And that's one of the theories of why you find all of the hominid bone, you know, you find homo sapiens and hominids. Yeah. There is because it was said that the hominid species were pushed to the ground. So if you're in the trees, you know, as hominid, you know, apes, you're strong. You move in packs. It's hard for predators to get to you. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, tough. So if you get pushed to the ground, it's a whole different movement. Your lateral movement, you know, you're not as you know, you're, you're not as strong as you would be in the trees. 
So that is said to have happened like 6 million years ago where this separation started. And over 3 million years, you have this highlands and lowlands forming and hominids pushed to the ground where they now have to adapt to lateral movement and being bipedal. And then you have another 3 million years of evolution into different, you know, to homo sapiens, which is interesting, but that's with a claim of why all these bones yeah. are being found or, in this or, particular or, region. Yeah, it, it's a, it, yeah. it's cra- yeah, it's definitely a rabbit hole that you you go down and it just it's it's never it's never ending. Um, we, we talk about the story of uh, of 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 the ark and uh, and how it got to Ethiopia. Um, you're in Nicaragua, which which I, I forgot to tell people. Uh, Nick is in uh, Nicaragua right now. He's not at his. Uh, well, you, you, we would know if you're at your home in Nicaragua. Connecticut, because you're always on the couch. It's always the exact same place. Um, <laughs> but since but since you're in Nicaragua, I would like to know a Nicaraguan story. Now I don't know this story, so I so I'm gonna hear it for the first time wait. along with wait. along with everybody else. Um, I was told by a friend of yours, <laughs> former colleague, um, about the time you choked out a horse in Nicaragua. Uh, yeah. What is what is, what is this story? You want to know what's crazy is that last week or the week before last, I found my old hard drive and I found the pictures of the horse. <laughs> and I, th- this, this story is, so this story is true. It's not a hundred percent true because I had a lot of help from my SUV taking out the horse. So it was 06, um, December of 06. It was, it was uh, at the time it was John Drew's wedding and the wedding was this extravaganza over like three days. And we were in Esteli and we had a combination kind of wedding party and factory Christmas party at a place about four kilometers north of Esteli. And um, I didn't even, I didn't drink at the time. So there was no drinking involved until oh, later, oh, okay. until later that night. Um, I was driving, it was, you know, it was like eight o'clock and we're heading to the party. And anybody that knows being here in Nicaragua, there's not lights on the roads, really. It's not really well lit. And I had a coworker and his wife in the back seat and we were driving and there's a huge problem in Nicaragua it, with high beams. Nobody knows how to turn down. Can we swear <laughs> on the show? Oh yeah. 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 Right, nobody turns down their fucking high beams. All right. Yeah. You get fucking high beams in your face. So I was going like 80 kilometers an hour. This guy's coming high beams in my face. Luckily I slowed down to about half that speed. And before I could see him, there was a pale white horse in front of the car. And I just hit you know, like the, the back end, the, the like halfway in between him and the back. And he went spinning off to the side. And luckily, everybody was all right. You know, I checked to make sure everybody's all right. And you could hear the horse just in sheer agony behind us, you know, on the side of the road. And my coworker's wife was an avid animal, you know, like animal person, like loved animals. And she was like, do you have a gun? You know, this poor horse, like the things in agony. And I was like, no, I don't have my gun on me. She's like, is the police going to be I'm like, no, it's probably going to take an hour before the police. <laughs> So I walked back to the horse and I was like, oh man, what were you doing in the middle of the road? Like, it was just awful. And I made one of the worst decisions of my life. I bent down and I grabbed this horse's jugular and started squeezing as hard as I could. And it was, I was like, what are you doing? And it was it was horrible when I was just you know these things are powerful even though this wasn't like you know uh, a, a crate you know like a hundred thousand dollar horse but and I'm just squeezing squeeze and the thing like had a seizure and it jolted me back up on my feet and then he was gone 
And all this time, the the party had gotten word of the crash. So Jesse at the time from yeah. Jewish State, Big yeah. Jesse, comes on the scene. And they're actually the pictures, I think, that he took. But he sees me behind the car, like kneeling down to this horse. And he walks over and it's pitch dark. You can't really see anything. And he thought I was consoling the horse. <laughs> so I'm sitting here choking this horse out. And he comes over it and he goes, he pats my back and he goes, it's all right, buddy. It's going to be okay. And then walks away. <laughs> Oh my God! I'm gonna. Yeah. I, I I will message Fabian tomorrow. And be like, why did you make him? Why did you make him tell the story? I knew it was Fabian. Unbelievable, <laughs> Fabian! You, That's you fucker! Do because we didn't yeah. know the story. Yeah, I didn't know. Dude. I didn't know the story. He just told me. He goes, it's, this it's is a, a horrible story, story man. I tell oh Fabian God. like. I know. Now it's on record. Jesus. I, I know. I thought yeah, it was going to be some kind of funny, drunken no, story, baby. Not at all. Listen, well, I ended up getting plastered that night. Yeah, it was like the first. You. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was really, horrible. It's one of those Fabian. things where you, when you hurt, when you hit an animal, you know, be it a deer or anything, you know, I mean, it's just, it's not pleasant, Yeah, you know? So you did the right thing though. You put it out of its misery. Yeah. I mean, that, there was just no way. I don't even it. know if I really did anything, <laughs> yeah. but um, it, yeah, it was horrible. I, Fabian, Fabian did that because I always tell, get him to tell him his Star Wars story. He has <laughs> some crazy Star Wars story about Mark Hamilton. Okay. Okay. So uh, we're gonna write that down uh, next time yeah. we talk with Fabian. Like, all right, yeah. Fabian, you 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 told him. You know, ask him. Tell, ask him about it. Ask a, him about it. About this Star His Wars. story is much. His story is much. Uh, not as dark. Yeah. Not, yeah. yeah. I'm like, God, I thought that I didn't, I did not expect this story to go here. So yeah. I, I'm yeah. sure Nick was like, I really didn't want to share that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did. Yeah. So <laughs> it's not a story I enjoy talking about. Yeah. I mean, all it, the time, yeah. Yeah. Fabian if just, someone asked me about it, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, yeah. Well, uh, don't feel bad. I was driving one time and uh, decapitated a goose and a goose oh, head God. off because I didn't see it. Cause I was li like, I'm from New Jersey and I was out like in hundred and County where it's like, it's, there's no lights either. And I didn't see it. And it was flying. I guess it kind of like got in front of my car and I hit it and I was like, Oh my God, what did I hit? And I got out and I saw its head was off and I was like, Oh my God. Like oh, that's terrible. fucking disgusting. So yeah. So don't feel too, too, too bad. It's yeah. It that happens. sounds, <laughs> that sounds terrible. It's crazy that you asked about it because I literally just, I hadn't seen these pictures in forever oh, and God. I managed to come across them <laughs> and it had been a while. Yeah. C crazy, crazy coincidence. You know, that, that he'd asked me to ask you that, uh, that, that yeah. story. So like I'll, have to, I'll have to mention that to him. And so, the car was totaled. Yeah. Oh, yeah, luckily wow. I had signed the uh, insurance cause it was a <laughs> rental car. Oh, but, my God. oh my, yeah. oh my it God. Was, it was so, rough. Uh, so, so we're, we're, we're an hour and a half in, we should probably talk about some cigars, um, on, 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 on the cigar show. So I, I have, a uh, um, I am smoking, uh, uh, oh, the, uh, 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 yeah, uh, a little, a little upsetter from, from the little box. Cause it, 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 it yeah, tends, yeah, the it, it tends, yeah. So, um, yeah. people always ask me about the, uh, the upsetters about uh, ask us. Cause I said, it's one of our f favorite infused, uh, uh, uh cigars. I, I, I like somehow now all of a sudden that is your cigar I, I think no it's not it's the it, first time i think i've no it, it's smoke. been a while it's been a couple months since i've smoked one but it, it's a question that i get because people always see the the acid sign you oh, know hey okay. you know you know what, what other i've tried the, the kuba kuba i've tried this what what other would you recommend you know and i always say you know definitely if you haven't had the upsetters definitely try the upsetters and then i'll, I'll see online people like flavored versus infused so is it flavored or infused? And then the other question I always get, does it still contain Jamaican tobacco? So, yeah. So it's in, it's infused. Um, what, what I wanted to do is make something that was a little bit more balanced with the blend. So it wasn't, it's infused, right? So people, yeah. some people 
you know, they're just totally against infused cigars. Others are, are much more open. And, you know, as you know, uh, people, whether the hardcore guys realize it or not, I mean, infused cigars are some of the most uh, enjoyed cigars in the marketplace. Yeah. Right. But I wanted to make, you know, something that was a little bit less kind of upfront infusion and sweet and a little bit more balanced with the blend. And, you know, as you can see, my love for Jamaican culture started really early on in my career in cigars. And if you see the whole portfolio of foundation, I really took the approach of being a tobacconist and having worked in a cigar store and being able to offer a portfolio if you only had foundation in your humidor, right? Let's say yeah. just for that day, all you have is foundation. As you know, as, as tobac a tobacconist running a cigar shop, you have all different types of people coming through that door in the course of the day. Some people like strong, they want medium, they want infused, light, and then also price points, right? You yeah. got some people that have a certain budget, don't have a budget. So if you look at the whole portfolio from Charter Oak to High Clear Castle being, you know, the super premium Charter Oak here every day, Best Buy, and then everything in between, it was important, you know, I felt to have an infused cigar. And, you know, I was in Jamaica in 2015 for Bob's 70th birthday. So I, I spent the whole day at his house. And at the end of the night, everything was being broken down. And I observe a guy pull out a whole leaf of tobacco from his pocket and unfold <laughs> this leaf. And of course it struck my attention. And I said, man, you know, where, where did you get this? Where did it, you know, come from? And I spent the next 10 days searching for tobacco. So if you go west of Kingston, you have an area called May Penn, which was the main growing region for, for tobacco. And that's where the Royal Jamaica factory was. But most of the tobaccos for the industry, um, you know, the industry kind of faded away at the end of the 90s. But most of it was being grown in that region. And then it turns out that you have tons of people growing in the mountains. So you have a ton, a ton of small, smaller farmers that are growing all different types of crops and tobacco is still one of those crops. Um, so I, I highly considered even before that at one time, wouldn't it be cool to resurrect the cigar industry within Jamaica? Um, unfortunately that would be quite the task because there's not the infrastructure there. So what you, what you lack in Jamaica right now is curing barns, which is, you know, crucial for growing yeah. uh, dark air cured, cured tobaccos. Uh, so it, it would be quite the feat, but I, I managed to, you know, develop some relationship with some farmers. The tobacco is very mild, right? So people ask, well, why didn't you come out with, why'd you do an infused? The level of the quality of tobacco in the Jamaican market is not because it hasn't been there for so long is not at the level of Honduras, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, you know, Mexico. Um, and it's just a very mild, smooth and creamy tobacco. So I use some of it in the blend. I knew it would be good for an infused cigar because it was on the milder, it absorbed you know, uh, flavors really well. And I knew I'd need to blend it with Nicaragua tobaccos in order to make it work because it, it just was not working from a, uh, you know, just a purely filler Jamaican yeah. tobacco. It just, it just wasn't there. So, you know, upsetters, people don't realize was the, the name of Lee Scratch Perry, who was one of uh, Bob Marley's early producers who used to work for a studio called Studio One. And then when he went solo, he developed uh, a song called I Am The Upsetter. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not really to, uh, people think like upset, it's actually, he, he always claimed is to raise people up. Yeah. yeah. You know, to have something new, um, 
you know, something to raise people up, not as, you know, sort of it, like it was, people it was being upset. Sh- like shake people up, get them thinking, get them to be more open. Like yes. that was the message. And also the, it does play on being like the underdog. Yeah. You yeah. Know, like the David and Goliath. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So um, upsetters, you know, is loosely based on an old uh, Jamaican cult, cult classic called the harder they come um and then kind of all the names ska which is named after ska music you know rude boy all come from sort of that jamaican cult classic called the harder they come i love that yeah. so, so so with um um so so I, so california they, they just the supreme court just failed to overturn yeah. the the flavored yeah. cigar industry thing um yeah. where is uh, where is infused cigars going with this because you got more and more states now in, in you know banning flavored cigars and and we know and we know the the small flavored cigars they're talking about ones that are yeah. great great pina colada cherry strawberry yeah. whatever those but I know some of the infused are being lumped in with that um is is that the case you know, is you know, or, or, or is infused being being separated? Yeah, from that? It, it's unfortunately it, it's a, there's a lot of confusion and in interpretation of the law, yeah. especially in California. Uh, you know, you it, it's hard to get answers um, sometimes. So, you know, things are made and put on the books, but then there's no there's there's a lack of clarity. Yeah. So, um, you know. Uh, to my knowledge, certain infused cigars are still being sold. Um, you know, I, th- I believe acid is still being sold, but other cigars that are characterizing flavors are not. So yes. it's being termed as characterizing flavors. So things that are cherry, chocolate, um, things that when you smell them and light them up, you're like, oh, that's vanilla. Um, these, these would be things termed as characterizing flavors. Whereas something like upsetters would be a non-characterizing flavor. So okay. you smell it, you're like, what is that? You know, you don't, you, you, it's not really, you know, you're not smoking chocolate. You're not smoking strawberry. Um, so um, a lot, a lot of these cigars are, are being characterized as that, if they're that, right. I mean, that's what I developed upsetters was to be a non-characterizing flavor because I kind of knew, some of this stuff was coming down the pipeline. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So th- that's what, you know, clarity. We haven't gotten that yet. You know, what is the definition of premium hand rolled cigars, you know, versus everything else? So you're not, you're, so you're not seeing that yet in any, anyways. Well, we're so, seeing that in yeah. California. Yeah. It, I mean, yeah. They, they just banned all those. I mean, Massachusetts also has a law on it, but because we're not a characterizing flavor, we're able to sell it into these areas. Yeah. But if you have a coffee cigar, that might be tough. That 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 is that is tough. You know, especially one that yeah. is just says cafe latte versus you know Correct. like a well, you there know. There is a couple, obviously. Yeah, and, and there are some that are you know like like we'll say the tobacco, you know, which doesn't necessarily it doesn't say coffee. It's just well, the name, you know, so, but there are, that. but yeah, there are some that just say, you know, cappuccino, cafe yes. latte, you know, so it's. Those things would be not permissible yeah. to my knowledge. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah. You know, and, and, and one, I, I'm sure, you know, Johnny Bravo, you know, you, you probably get this question a ton. The JRE cigars that ever going to be available to the public. So Man, obvi- yeah. obviously not under that name. Um, cause yeah, the, cause I, the, cause the Aroas would probably have something with the JRE. Yeah, I, you know, I forgot all about that, but that's, yeah, that, uh, it, it might help, uh, it might help, it might help everybody overall. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's not currently on the, on the market. It's only made for Joe. Um, and you know, it's, it's in Joe's hands. You know, I make them for him. It's crazy. You know, he's, he's given us a lot of shout outs and I'm, I'm truly humbled by by it but unless joe gives the word you know they're just being made for joe yeah. unless you see joe or sometimes i have some on me you know and, okay 
some people ask me if they see me. I didn't have any of them on me in Florida, but sometimes I have them. But I don't, um, I don't think some people know what you're even talking about. Oh, the, the Joe Rogan <laughs> podcast, the J, uh, JRE podcast. You know, uh, yeah. uh, Nick Nick makes the cigars right. for for I think, Joe. To, I think somebody. I think somebody. Did yeah. That they didn't yeah. So Joe Joe started smoking c- cigars a lot back in 2020. For uh, he does something called Sober October. And uh, he ended up starting to smoke foundation cigars. He was smoking the wise man Maduro for a while. Keep, and keep then, going. I'm going to be right back. Okay. Sure. And then I ended up making uh, a special cigar just for him called the Joe Rogan experience. And uh, it's a, it's a blend. It's a Connecticut broadleaf blend. When I blended tabernacle for the first time, there were seven blends that I was working from. So it's one of the seven blends that uh was not the one that i use in the regular tabernacle production so oh. he uh yeah he really took to him and you know as a newer smoker he tends to like you know smokier scotches peatier scotches he likes spicy barbecue so oh. normally i wouldn't make something that strong for someone that was just starting to smoke but I, I had a feeling he would he would take to that blend, and sure enough, he did. And I ended up hooking him up with a nice humidor. Oh, so nice. he's yeah. He's, yeah, I, I was watching like something on TikTok, like hit on his show, and like one of the guys that he had on there, and I, I don't know why I can't remember his name right now. Was like basically saying. I don't know if I trust Joe's palate. Like they're like when Joe's like tries like to get into something, he doesn't just like try it like he's all in like yeah and that all or nothing yeah that was bert uh kreischer was kind of like skeptical but bert didn't didn't (laughs) know uh his friend robert kelly who's another comedian kind of kind of set him straight Uh, yeah i I, I saw that i saw that tiktok you guys posted about uh yeah with that yeah, yeah, that thing went crazy man that that was my kevin i said listen it's not like like any of us are really like cigar experts, but I was like, you can kind of tell they didn't really understand some, you know, some of like the cigar like stuff. Like he was like, Oh, I didn't trust his palate. What do you, what do you mean? You brought like, or trust the cigars. Like, what do you mean? Like what could have been wrong with them? Like, where'd you think he got them from? (laughs) He had claimed that like three years ago, he had gotten a cigar from Joe and it was dry. Oh, so that oh, that's okay. why there's context. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's confused. why. Yeah, that's why he he. Hold on one second, my lamp. Who's that? Who is it? Enoch. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm just on a podcast here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You all right? All right. Enoch is one of the artists here for Foundation Cigars, and he's been feeling under the weather. And he left his medicine here. Oh, he got some, he someone working for you named Enoch too. What is? Yeah, yeah <laughs> of course, man. Enoch is Enoch is uh, an ancient man. You good? Jesus. What do you got? The gripe? Jesus. All right, go easy. All right, if you need anything, let me know. All right. Okay, have I owe you? Yeah, Enoch's the man. Right, right. Name. The Book yeah, he, of Enoch. You know about the Book of Enoch? I I know about the Book of Enoch. Oh, I, I wish I wish people knew knew more about the Book of Enoch, and uh, that's all about the aliens, right there. Enoch. That's a that special. Was, you know, that's a special text, and that goes way back. That's that's originally an Ethiopian text. Is it? I, I didn't know that. I, oh I know, yeah. yeah. The, I, the, I know Enoch was wasn't Enoch the only person in biblical text not to die he wasn't he not he, call, he, called to heaven yeah and he ascended to the heavens yeah he was yeah. the only one that didn't die yeah he was said to be a contemporary of um some say noah yeah um yeah and pre-flood yeah, and uh yeah there's different enochs in the bible but this one particularly and the text was rediscovered by a british supposedly there's there's different takes on it uh by a a british explorer called james bruce in the 1600s who traveled 
to Ethiopia and brought the text back. But part of it was discovered also in the Dead Sea Scrolls yeah. in, uh, I think it was in Qumran. Yeah, and it Qumran. was written originally, the original text is it written in a, a language called Giz, uh, G-E apostrophe E-Z. Giz is the Latin language to Amharic, which is the current language of Ethiopia. So it's an ancient Sanskrit language that goes back, uh, they say, you know, 4,000, 5,000 BC. And that's where it originally comes from was Ethiopia. Oh, I, I didn't know that, but yeah, people, oh, look yeah. Up, uh, yeah, people look up the book of Enoch. Like I said, some crazy stories, you know, it's uh, ancient. It, it's it, ancient. It is. So, yeah. all right. So, uh, uh, the, the, the cigar we're going to talk about next is, uh, well, well first let, let's watch a little video on the cigar. All right. Now, now I didn't get a chance to get my hands on a box, but I did. I did. Oh, smoke, come on! I, I did smoke one, and it was fantastic. Um, Email me your address. Yeah. All right. So, so what? What is? What is? I got is my it, special stash. I got. I got. I got a special stash. Right. So, so it's. Is it pronounced Senator? Senator? S yeah, it's Senator. Oh, Senator. Yeah, Senator, which means incense of the gods. Okay. Oh, per yes. perfect. In perfect. ancient Egyptian, yeah. So it's a it's an actually uh, we had an Egyptologist from Yale actually work on this project with us to make sure the the hieroglyphs on the box were all correct. But that is a replica of one of the boxes found within King Tut's tomb. Oh, um, okay. Yes. So. So uh, so how, how how long was this project? How long are you working on this? Because obviously it celebrated the hundredth. 100th anniversary which was november 1922 so this past yeah. november was the 100th year uh this has been uh, for a couple of years um it was actually one i don't tell these guys this but one of the one of the main reasons why i i worked on the high clare castle project because i was aware of the history at high clare and the great grandfather working with howard carter and he was one of the main reasons, you know, backers of Howard Carter that, discovering. That's what, that's what I was going to ask you. Most people don't know, you know, the, the, yeah. the correlation between High Care, High Clare Castle and Howard Carter. Yes, very intimate relation. So uh, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, who lived at High Clare in, in the early 1900s, was an early race car driver. And his doctor told him he needed to spend the winters in drier climates, at which point he started traveling to Cairo and becoming an amateur archaeologist, which I, I, I would imagine that would be difficult not to do if you're you're in Egypt in the early 1900s. Befriends yeah. Howard Carter, who Howard Carter was convinced that there was another tomb in the Valley of the Kings, which everybody else had kind of dismissed it at that point, and I believe was was part of the excavation. Uh, for close to five years before I think they were on their last month of the dig in November, 1922, when one of the workers actually tripped on a yeah. step where the, they were actually housing, there was tents set up where they were actually living. And one of the stones was under the tent, which led into the discovery of, of one of the most amazing discoveries of our time. Um, so, you know, High Clare, there's an exact replica of the tomb under the castle, oh, which really? I had the pleasure of visiting in, I think, 2017 now. And um, so uh, my, my partner in the project, Adam and Lord Carnarvon, asked if I would do a special box for the 100th year anniversary course i couldn't 
I couldn't deny that request. No, so, not, not at all. What 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 yeah. the bo- what the box factory say to you? <laughs> you know? It was insane, man. I, I my art director Alex and I worked on it very closely. I mean, it was a it was a challenging project. Um, let me see if I think I have one. Sorry about the noise here. <laughs> this was actually one of the first replicas, so it's not in good shape. Um, but it it was challenging. We, you know, the box maker actually made the box, and then we had a different um, artisan actually do the gold foil oh, okay. on on the whole box. So it's all gold foiled on the outside, and then it, again we had these Egyptologists from Yale who are actually on digs in in Egypt. They actually are in more of the less known areas of. Egypt looking for like different settlements okay. and whatnot. Um, and they worked on all the hieroglyphs to make sure there's only one change in the hieroglyphs, which is on the top here, which actually spells out high Claire uh, in ancient hieroglyphs. Oh, okay. Uh, but the rest of it is true to form. That was actually on the box. So, um, I developed a special blend in a six and three quarter by 52 perfecto and 12 count. Uh, we did 700 boxes and yeah. So, was, so not, 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 not a cheap cigar that they retail for about $30 a piece. 33. 33. So where, yeah. so obviously the box is part of that, you know, part of that cost. Um, yeah, but the course. one thing that I was reading about, uh, you know, um, you talk about, you know, on the description, the seventh priming Ecuadorian Habano. Is that, is that, is that normal to have that many primings? Yeah. Yeah. For in Ecuador, it is, um, you can get up to nine primings because the plant gets so tall because of the cloud cover in Ecuador. Okay. Okay. So the cloud is, is acting as a natural kind of canopy. Uh, This is why Connecticut shade is taken so well in Ecuador, whereas Connecticut shade grown in the Connecticut River Valley was we would put cheesecloth tents above all of the fields to filter that light and create a microclimate under the tents. Whereas in Ecuador, that's naturally being formed because of the cloud cover. So hence, you don't have the sun exposure. So the plant is growing, trying to reach the light um, so the oh, the plants get much taller uh, okay. in, in in ecuador yeah it's um i don't know if i could uh let me see if i have am i able to share screen or no you should be able to if uh, you should have let's, the thing that it says at the bottom present let's say uh, present where, where people find that cigar um if, if you if you google the cigar you can still find them um i did look before the show at a couple of sites and everybody is out oh, okay. like like nobody uh, you know nobody has them so i'm sure there's probably yeah there um can you see this or no yeah let me put it up here so oh, oh wow, wow. So that's Connecticut, that's Connecticut shade. It's not the, the Habano, which is the different seed, but that's Connecticut yeah. shade seed. But if you can see how many primings there are and. And look at the flowers it, on top too. It's one of the rare places that, that um, lets the flower bloom on the plant. Because what happens is when you let the flower bloom, um, it ends up reducing the weight of the actual leaf, making it thinner for wrapper grade tobaccos. Okay. So usually, usually you're getting one, two, three, four, five, um, six, up to seven priming before you're then topping the flower. And they call that desflorado. I don't know if you ever heard of desflorado I've, I've, wrapper. I've, I've heard that term before. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I'm actually desflorando the the plant. <laughs> I'm removing. The plant and then those last primings will be used for the desflorado which is much darker and thicker because it's the much it's a much higher higher priming um what how tall do they get yeah that looked like a, that had been like nine feet That's I don't yeah know. yeah yeah, yeah nine nine ten feet yeah so yeah. the habano ecuador is very similar in in that it gets that tall so you have different Primings and those higher primings, of course, are thicker and uh, they get a bit darker. But it's not 
like a super when you get into the ninth primings and sometimes the the eighth ninth they get it gets super dark yeah um i like that seventh because it's right in there where it's more of that cafe maduro like yeah. that coffee style you know where it's not like super super dark and it's not it's not light um, okay now yeah. now okay so now i i don't want you to have to justify a 33 dollar you know price yeah. tag on a cigar but is there something what what can people expect of this cigar? So when there's what is Steve Sock? What does Steve Saka say? <laughs> yeah, it, it came from melons or something. Like that. Yeah, I, I gotta yeah, learn uh, Steve's. Yeah, no, I'll was, tell you. I'll tell you yeah. exactly why. Uh, I mean, I'll, yeah, call, I'll call answer call, that question. Cultivo Tonto is what his he took Cultivo that from Tonto? the yeah from yes. from the melon thing where he picks out. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it was picked out of um, uh, goat turds and then fermented in no i'm kidding um uh, so pricing so one the wrapper that it takes longer in fermentation one of the key issues for tobaccos that are much more expensive is time right yeah yeah tobacco can be fermented much quicker tobacco can be fermented slowly i always compare it to my grandmother's pasta sauce Right. It's the difference between opening up a can, throwing it into a pot, turning on the heat and you're ready to go. She's at low temperatures, best ingredients, eight hours a day, low simmer. Why? Because once you start turning the heat up, you start losing a lot of the essential oils to the elements. Right. Eventually, if you just kept that pot boiling, you're going to end up losing the whole thing. I mean, it's just yeah. going to evaporate down into nothing. The same goes with fermentation, right? That takes time and money, right? This is why a lot of times tobacco can be fermented. You can bring temperatures up to, you know, 130, 140. You can get it done much quicker, but you lose a lot of the flavor and essential oils. So this is one factor. And also with the fillers, right? Fillers, one way of curing and fermenting fillers is to be able to bale cure fillers after fermentation. So they're taken to a certain point during fermentation, and then you're able to age them after that in the bale, which is just a slower fermentation. So this is what you have within this cigar, the box. And then also there's 750 boxes and it's the hundredth year anniversary of King Tut's Tut's tomb. Um, and, and that's that it. Definitely one, plays. One, one and done. That's it. Yeah. There's a, there's only. But I yeah. somebody else said, you know, time is money. And, time? Then, and Ronnie even said, you know, you get under fermented cigars, you know, we want the age, we want it to be, have good quality. So and it, yeah. and also it's a little bit of a luxury. I mean, there are people who spend their money on like coffees every single day that by the end of the week is way more than thirty three dollars. You know yeah. what I mean? So it depends on what you choose to spend your money on as well. A hundred percent. I mean, this is uh, King Tut's hundredth year anniversary only yeah. comes once yeah. every hundred years. years. Yeah. And absolutely. there's only seven hundred boxes, and you're using you know, the best ingredients right. um, on the cigar in the world of black tobaccos of cigar tobacco. I mean, that's where, that's where I've spent my time. Right. And this global world of cigar tobaccos, there's different levels of quality um, that you can use in your, in your blends. And I think that makes a world of difference. Right. And then it's also, of course, how you, how you put those ingredients together, but you know, Oh, yeah, it, it, and it, then exactly. we have also we have Egyptologists that got to get paid. We yeah. Got, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Have, have you have yeah, you have you s- doing the higher glyphs? Yeah. Have you seen the tomb yet? Have you been there? I have not. Oh um, my god! I but, can't. But a- Abe Abe went. A- well, I don't. I, I don't know if Abe. I don't know if Abe went and saw. They visited a pyramid. I don't know if they went. No, and saw he went. That he went to the great. He went to the great pyramid. He oh, was did, there. Did he, he was did, actually did. texting me when. This was, it was around the same time this was coming out. And I think I had seen a, a post of his online. And then he, I was like, are you in Egypt right now? And he started texting me pictures 
in the great pyramid and then i sent him pictures of this box and he was i actually gave him a box at the great smoke oh okay. that, was my, that was my gift to him when i start when, before the the show started um because i don't i don't know if he had ever seen or gotten one yeah. you know just oh, from the pyramid Abe got a box and you got a dollar, Kevin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got, yeah, yeah. We both got. Yeah, Abe and I both got something from uh, from from Nick. No, uh, just re remind me. Send me your definitely. Send me yeah. your your address because um, I I have a stash. Right, I think most of them have sold out now. I think you can you can find some here and there from from different shops, but most of them yeah. sold out uh, pretty quick. We had to allocate, you know. Uh, based on you know just having 700 boxes for the country so it was it was a task even at that price point it was uh you know it's again it's something special to have you know i'm saving some you know so i can smoke one every kind of november on the anniversary of the discovery and it's one of yeah. those special special cigars you save for you know a special occasion oh yeah and and, and, and i gotta get there even if i go even if i don't get in to see the tomb I've got to stand next to a pyramid. I need to understand that that uh that that size because I you know a couple of years ago we went to the Statue of Liberty oh and I was able yeah. to stand underneath there and then now I can I, I can justify the size in my mind because I was there. I was actually talking to Steve about this last week and he he had gone I think I want to say when he was with the Navy and we were talking about the Colosseum in Rome, which he was not as impressed by based on, you know, what he built up in his mind. Yeah, but yeah. When, when he went to the, to the great pyramid, he was like, yeah, it's, it's fucking huge. It's, you know, the, the footprint is 13 acres. Oh yeah. God. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, it's, it's, it's pretty astonishing. I, I hope to go. I mean, I was immersed in, of course, King Tut, uh, documentaries and oh yeah and uh searches and you know, i can, found this yeah, old one sorry. yeah no, yeah. yeah but the the king tut's tomb is, is is really interesting because it's not the normal size of a king's chamber for a tomb it's rather small yeah. um normally they they were much larger so they 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 think that it was built in in haste and there's also this weird mold that had built up on one of the, the frescoes in the tomb, which is not found anywhere else, which they think came from the humidity of the paint when it was yeah. sealed up. But they've also found, you know, a, a lot of times the Egyptians would build fake walls and chambers to throw off uh, grave robbers. Yeah. Which King Tut's tomb seal was broken two times and then resealed so nobody ever got to it um which means they had people protecting the valley of the kings and they were caught and then it was resealed but there's one wall now with modern technology that they actually think there's potentially another tomb on the other side of the wall um, yeah um, was it um, a, are they thinking uh, was it Nef nefertiti's tomb yeah, which was his mother. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I it was thought, his mother. And yeah, then they had found like a tomb, I think, underneath his chamber that was like or, flooded, like was, possibly. Like, like, kind of yeah. So, so it, like, it'll be it'll be interesting to see if they because because we got the like the retail, you know, or the, like the details, you know, because they sent yeah. like the muons through from the you know from the yeah. sun and space, and now we see what the this chamber looks like. So hopefully they, I don't know, we need to get Crazy. in there. We need to get in there. It's all you just got to you just got to break apart this fresco. That's you know <laughs> 2000 years old. But I, I think it's worth it. I'm, I'm going to say it right now. It's, I mean, uh, if Nefertiti's in there, that would be amazing. I that, mean. that that would be um, we're going to move on to the to the to, to the next our final cigar. I want to talk about tonight. Let's watch sure. a little video from this cigar.
Cigar Snobs, number one cigar of 2022, the Olmec. Um, that cigar, I, I said, I haven't seen buzz around a cigar in like a couple of years, you know. And then the cigar just took the industry by storm. I mean, it was it was nuts at it's the end of last year. It's still nuts. I, yeah. It, 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 it is. So, so the Olmec, uh, yeah. Okay. It's interesting you, how some cigar, you know, yeah, yeah, they just, it's like lightning in a bottle sometimes. It, it, it really is. Like everybody is talking about this. Have you seen the giant colossal heads yet? So I haven't seen the giant colossal heads until I saw one of them back in like, Oh six, Oh seven. So I used to go to San Andreas Tuxtel every year to purchase tobacco. And that's when I originally learned of the Olmecs. I was actually given a book by an older Mexican farmer called the smoking gods which was mainly about the Mayan smoking culture. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this book is available, but if you, anybody finds it, The Smoking Gods, it's this gigantic hardcover cover book, and it's very detailed. But there was some mention of the Olmecs, and I had seen one, but it wasn't like one of the official like ones that was out in, uh, there's this place called San Lorenzo. Um, and I've just always been captivated by, you know, this culture, which is really mysterious. I mean, there's not a whole yeah. lot really known about these these colossal heads or the Olmec culture. Uh, I want to say late 30s, they started discovering some of these colossal heads. And they were like, these aren't Mayan. These aren't, you know. Yeah, because unfortunately this they is, didn't have a lot of written language back then, you know, so it was just passed down. Yeah, I wonder if some of it was destroyed, um, too, by, you know, the Spanish did a number oh, yeah. on yeah. Central America, <laughs> yeah. you yes, know, yeah, so. Under, understatement, but yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if some of these guys, because all, you know, this is the mother culture of Central America as far as as we know. So all of which I didn't realize is all the calendars, you know, the pyramids all come from the Olmec civilization. This is what the Mayans, you know, really modeled, uh, uh, of course, the calendars and then the pyramids. They, they have pyramids in this area of the Olmecs that haven't even been completely uncovered. There's one called the Pyramid of the Sun. Yeah. And it's still overgrown. I mean, it's not even been yeah. excavated yeah i remember that insane. just a couple of years ago they're using the lidar you know flying over the jungle and they're finding these pyramids that was in yeah that was in tikal which was in guatemala okay uh, they, they found sixty thousand. the lidar technology is changing everything this is what they used in the amazon to discover they found actually they found pyramids now in the amazon which is yep. which yeah. is crazy but yeah they're discovering um so much and the Olmecs were the first to use tobacco that we know of. I mean, I, I think it goes back farther. Um, I, I've actually read recently within the past year that there's um, actually settlements in Nevada that were discovered that go back to 12,500. And uh, there's been remnants of tobacco found, found there. Oh, wow. But one of the if not the earliest civilization that, that used um, tobacco. And it's all in the same reason of where all of the Mexican San Andreas, which the San Andreas Negro seed, to my knowledge, does predate the Habanesis seed. Um, so from what we know of tobacco, is they're dating it 2.1 million years old from Peru. They actually found the first fossilized tobacco in Peru. Really? Yeah. So it's the gentleman that discovered the uh, saber tooth tiger. He's a Dutch uh, gentleman. I forget his name, but he also discovered fossilized tobacco in, in Peru and they dated it to 2.1 million years, which is the beginning of what they call this age, the Pleistocene age, which yep. was this beginning of this ebb and flow of ice ages, 2.1 million years ago. 
but it is said that it's then spread up through Central America into Mexico and then across to Cuba um, from there. So if you see the maps and you see the maps where they show kind of the, the, the ocean floors, you will see in that part of the world near the Yucatan where before the, the last ice age, that was all land. The land spread out much farther and almost touches Cuba. Um, so there was a whole different trade system going on. I mean, there were so many more islands in these in these regions. So it, it, it makes sense that it would have predated the Cuban Sea. Cubans, I, I'm sure, do not like to hear this, but right. yeah, yeah, because um, they, they say it was the the, the the Taino Taino in you know from Cuba. They were the first, and yeah, now yeah, I mean this it goes back it goes back a long way. Like like we said before, I mean half the story I don't think has has been told, but it's it's one of my favorite tobaccos. You know, it's one of the oldest seed varieties, and it happens to come from the same region of the Olmec. So I thought it was perfect to, to develop a whole cigar around it. Um, you know, yeah. I work with Abdel Fernandez with it and, you know, Mexican tobacco, great example, right. Of back to this fermentation conversation in Mexico, every growing region of tobacco kind of has their own customs in San Andreas in Mexico. There's always been this culture of they don't really prime tobacco the same way that it's done um, in Nicaragua, Dominican, Honduras. It's usually done in two primings where they'll just prime the bottom part of the plant and then the top. And then it goes into the barns. They use hardwoods to remove some of the moisture in the leaves in the curing barns. And then typically it would come out and go into 10, 12,000 pound fermentation piles. Why? The, that's the larger huge, the yeah. ferment, it's huge. The larger the fermentation pile, though, you can get more of that pressure to get the heats triggered more to get fermentation going much faster, right? So, what what we do is not do that fermentation. You know, in, in Mexico, the tobacco comes from the barns and then is shipped to Nicaragua, where it then goes through slower, longer fermentation here in Nicaragua to again keep those essential oils, keep that flavor, you know, retain the, the good stuff, uh, which again is, is crucial in making, you know, premium top end stuff. Yeah. Now that, now that cigar comes in uh, the Mexican San Andreas Maduro and yeah. San Andreas Claro. Yeah. Now, so I, I think everybody's familiar with the term Claro, but yeah. I, I don't know. I, you know, I don't hear often San Andreas Claro being yeah. used. Is, not, is, is that is that not something that's used, or is it just not a term that people? It's not there? used as much because everybody's seeking the Maduro, right? Okay. It's tough. It's tough to get Maduro a lot of times. There's not a, a crazy amount of, of places that produce a you know a really dark Maduro wrapper. So in Mexico, typically, you know, everybody's seeking out the dark stuff because oh, okay. we're buying crops. We got, we got the whole cow. So I, I really love the Claro personally. I, I tend to, to gravitate of course, personally towards darker, heavier cigars, but I like lighter cigars from time to time. I'll smoke. Yeah you know, a charter oak in the morning with a cup of coffee yeah. or it depends on the moment and, and, and where you're at and, and, and what you want in that moment. So the Claro was really interesting because not a lot of people use it. Um, and it's a really beautiful leaf and it has a completely, to me, unique profile compared to the Maduro. So when you're in the curing barns, when they're curing in the curing barns in Mexico, they're using hardwoods to remove moisture from the leaf, right? That's one of the problems. We're trying to get uh, moisture. When, when the leaf comes from the field, it, you're at 90% moisture content. It's almost like our bodies, 90% water. So we're, we're removing uh, moisture. Those hardwoods produce a real smokiness, okay? The leaf picks up on that. What happens is in the fermentation of the higher primings, it's in fermentation much longer. 
And as it goes to fermentation, it starts to lose that smokiness as it's fermented and it becomes sweeter because you're changing, you know, the starches into sugars and it, it's, it's sweeter. Whereas the Claro, I feel maintain, you can get more of that smokiness from the hardwoods from that barn because it's not going as long in that fermentation. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Now, yeah, now, it, that, now, is the blend the same on both cigars, or did you have to tweak it a little it's bit? It's tweaked. It's tweaked to. I, I rarely will do something where it's just the same. Yeah. So there's a, there's always slight adjustments made um, on the filler combinations for the Claro compared to the Maduro, uh, okay. because the Maduros, you know, they're thicker. And they also are able to balance sometimes the filler leaves because they're buffering some of the strength. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah. So if you take fun, if yeah. you if you take like uh, if you take like Tabernacle and you took the broadleaf off and put a, a Connecticut Shade wrapper, most likely that's going to be very aggressive. Why? Yeah. Because Connecticut Shade is so thin. Yeah. Uh, you know the vein structure is thin. The cellular walls of the leaf very thin. So you're really going to get hit with a lot of that blend because that blend is mainly Viso and Lijeros heavier, whereas Broadleaf is thicker, it's veinier, it's, and it buffers out a lot of that strength. I'm sorry, my neighbor. No, has, no, that, that, that's okay. This, yeah. this alarm uh, it, it drives me crazy all day. It's so, going on. Ronnie, Maduro is better. Claro is far more unique. I, I found the Claro definitely more unique, and I, and I, you know, I like a Maduro. I found the Claro, you know, for, for me was, was much, uh, um, uh, I preferred that one a little bit more. Ronnie did uh, earlier. He's like, uh, um, uh, he said something about uh, your, your disdain for cellophane. Um, oh, no, as, and, uh, you, and UPC codes. And UPC codes. Okay. <laughs> a lot of people don't use UPC codes, Ronnie. But uh, uh, cellophane, I do notice that you have a disdain for cellophane. I, I'm coming out with new t-shirts at the summertime. Say no to cello. <laughs> they should be they should be out for the uh, for the summer. I Listen, <laughs> I personally, as a cigar smoker, I uh, let me explain why. You go through this amazing process, okay? We have seeds that are smaller than a grain of sand. They go through seed beds. They're planted in the earth. They grow from the sunlight and water and all this care is taken months, years. Then it goes into this natural fermentation process, 7,000 pounds, it's controlled compost. It goes through this journey and then into curing rooms and into a wood box. It pains me to have to put a poly cello it just, I can't, and, and not only that is, to me, it's a holy experience to be able to open up a box yeah. and pull those cigars out and really know they're aging together. It definitely, for me, makes a difference in, in that process where they're all marrying together and they're not separated, again, by this poly plastic. <laughs> Listen, I understand it's not functional in a cigar shop. You got a lot of breakage. You're dealing with people sometimes that are, you know, sticking these things in their noses and they're touching them too much. And I just have trouble doing it on certain projects. All right. There, 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 there you go, Ronnie. So there, there's your, there, there's your answer. So hope it's a condom. It's yeah. 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 Charles yeah. and Pelican Gaze and drops on the floor. Listen, yeah. I get it. I get it. I just can't do it. You gotta be you gotta be careful. You gotta be careful. Uh, then, Ronnie, just tell that story, Ronnie. So um uh so so now people know why. Ronnie's the man. Yeah. 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 So all right, so we're gonna we're gonna get into some some questions that I was what, asked. What's that? What do you I mean, would you what do you think about it? I'm curious. Like, do you does it matter to you? Does it it it, Do it does it? so so I so I have a dedicated humidor to non celloed cigars. 
Okay. That, uh, you know, um, I, in my big humidor, um, you know, I have a couple thousand cigars. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do get on non celloed cigars some issues sometimes with mold, you know, maybe wanting to start on yeah. a non cello. So yep. I, I just have a dedicated non cello humidor, deals with that. I keep it, I keep it around 60%, you know, so I don't have to deal with any of that. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, you I don't know. Get it up, though. You got to get it up, Kevin. You got to get them up. You got to get them up to about, you got to get them up in that 70, 72 range. Good let me tell you God. why. Yeah, yeah, let, let me tell you. Let me tell you. Wait, where are you living in Florida? Florida. Uh, I'm in Oh, uh, yeah. You got, yeah. A, you got a lot of humidity going on there. What's we, your we, we do. I, I really got to watch that humidity down Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, you're in a different condition, but I'm going to tell yes. you, you got to get it up into that 70 range, 72, because you want to get, you want to get those oils coming out of that wrapper. Yeah. So, so with that being saying? said, I, I'll try and keep my environment in the humidor to around 60 to 62 because okay. that, that means the cigars, because I do test mine all the time with the, with my cigar medics, uh, humidimeter, um, which, right. which I, which I have right here. So the cigars will be 67 in that, in that particular humidor, they will be 67 to 69%. Um, yeah. And then down here we have to deal with the heat. Anything I, more than that, we start to really see that right. mold. But start. I will tell you, when I started using some tupidors, and I threw my tu I put my tupidors in the closet, and the unsellowed stuff, I've never had yeah. any problems. With no, no, I, I just, I just have to Listen, keep an eye. You know, uh, here you gotta keep an eye on it. I got one of those, those pelican. Yeah, I actually yeah. personally. I've worked with my Pelican case and I put my cigars in there before I smoke them. So I'll go from the humidor then I put them in the Pelican hermetic seal them, but you got to be careful too much humidity. Yes. Yeah. And, and but that, I like that, to get yeah. them in that 72 because I don't like it when the, the wrappers get too dry. Yeah. yeah. That's where I have, if the wrapper gets too dry, you kind of, Put it into a state sometimes where the wrapper is not doesn't have enough moisture content and then you lose some of those oils that are coming out again you don't want to get it too high because you're going to have a problem like if you get it way too high but i tend to have the stuff that i'm ready to smoke more in that 70 yeah. kind of range but i put them in that pelican yeah, exactly and people reach out that. all the time you know about you know you know how do i keep my cigars humidity i'm like you gotta remember, I'm on the Gulf Coast of Florida. We're battling heat and humidity 12 months out of the year. So how I keep my cigars, you know, if you're in, you know, we, I, I had a buddy of mine, Dan, he just moved from, uh, he lived five minutes away from me, just yeah. moved to Tennessee. He's yeah. having a nightmare of trying to figure out if the cigars are cracking. He's having an issue. Oh, and then we get people, then we get people up North, you know, um, New Hampshire, Connecticut, well, Vermont. Also, and I'm like, I, I don't know what to do for well, you guys. Part of it too is right. When, when you take a cigar and you don't let it acclimate and you just add like heat. Yeah. To it, it's going yeah, to crack. Man. Yes, definitely. So Connecticut, right. So there's, there's, yeah, the different regions are very interesting. Connecticut in the North is dangerous when the heat goes on. So once the heat goes on in the houses, Connecticut's normally ranging, even in the wintertime, this is the interesting thing about Connecticut, is you still have high humidity in Connecticut, yep. even when it's freaking cold. Really? That's why they say, oh, yeah, you get, you have 50%. Hold on a second. Let me, let me, I mean, it's raining now, so it's not going to be a good reflection. But even when you get, I mean, you got 96% humidity right now. Um, in Connecticut and you're at 40 degrees, but it's raining there. But usually it's in, it can be in the 50 range, 60 range, even when it's 30 degrees out. Really? Wow. Because you still have, there's so much water up there. I mean, it's all like melted glaciers and whatnot. Yeah. So but when you put the heat on in your house, you're screwed because that starts sucking all the moisture content. You'll get readings inside your house of 15% moisture, humidity. 20% and it could be 50 something outside because all of those heaters okay. just totally suck out all the humidity. When we released Olmec at the trade show, we're in Vegas. I hate Vegas for releasing cigars. 
you're at 10% moisture content. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what happens when you take a cigar, especially a cigar that has a blend of Viso, Lijero, higher priming stuff, right? It's that's heavier leaf, it's thick, it's stronger. You that gets dried out, that totally changes the whole blend, the whole intention of the blend. I mean, if you smoke that at lower moisture content, you're having a whole different experience. Yeah. And people think it's kind of not a, a thing, but it's definitely, uh, it, it definitely affects your smoking experience. I mean, yeah. I told a lot of people, smoke these when you take them home. Let them acclimate. Let them I, get I, into that. I, I've heard a lot of manufacturers say the same thing. Out, they hate handing cigars out at Vegas, and they'll say the same thing. Please don't smoke these here. You know, they, they take them. Yeah, home. they think it's because you don't want them to smoke. You think it's going to be. It's like no, you're in the worst place. I mean, I would have to smoke in a humidor in order to get you know the right smoking experience. <laughs> no, exactly. Like I said when when I was at Vegas last year, TPE in just people outside, outside the the the, the hotel, like smoking. I'm like, what is? I, I bet it only takes five minutes. You know, being outside yeah. here, and like I said, all that humidity is just gone. You know, so. So, it's so crazy. yes, it, it, it is. It is uh, crazy. Um, let's see. Uh, let's get to our first uh, uh, a viewer question from Steve Saka. Oh, uh, boy. Why the fuck? And this Saka. is per I, I don't I don't I, not, I, I, I just Steve. people people ask me. I just repeat. Why the fuck That's... does he keep naming cigars that are unpronounceable? I'm assuming <laughs> that Steve cannot pronounce El Guganese um, or El Wednesday. Listen, what cigar cannot be pronounced but uh, Guganese? Yeah, and it's you know, a great it's, pasta sauce. Yeah, that's what it, are you, know, you talking about? What cigar? Sinetter is a is a more difficult one. Yeah, I I wanted to actually name the cigar KV sixty. Okay, there you go. That was which that, is that, which yeah. is the name of yeah. the how the tomb is classified in the Valley of the Kings. Yeah, you know, um, but but what's but I didn't come back. I see. I'm, I'm like Steve. Every podcast you're on, you have to tell people how to say me carita. You know, so you you ha, come on, how, me querida. Yeah, how, how are you bu- querida? Yeah, yeah querida. How are me you querida? Bu- yeah, how are you busting the uh, uh, Nick's chops? Yeah, on, on, no, on, on he's to- come on, Charter Oak Tabernacle, High yeah. Clare, Olmec. Olmec's not that difficult to. Yeah, I, I I know he he gets one. Because he can't pronounce El Wense. Well, I mean, and, and, we are talking about people in the society who uh, don't know how to say aid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Abe. Abe. Yeah, Abe. Yeah, That's you know. I wanted to challenge the, the market phonetically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Listen, yeah. well, Wense, well, Wense, I obviously knew people would have a very difficult time. <laughs> That was my first. You got to remember, though, when I started, nobody knew who I was except for the hardcore guys. Yeah. I mean, 2015, nobody knew really much about my experience except yeah. for the guys that were really kind of, you know, into cigars and and following the experience. So I knew those guys would appreciate or get into the name Will Wednesday, yeah. you know, and and it, it, for me, it was it, you know, my artistic, you know, side comes through in wanting to honor you know, Nicaragua in the proper way. And to put it in English at the time, I would have gotten a lot of shit from, from the Nicaraguan people, but it was, uh, you know, it's a challenge. It's a challenge with Wednesday. It's cool to see how many people know it now. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It is. I said, versus, I would say even a year ago, you know, like people, you know, but, but now like you hear like, like just average cigar smokers, you know, they're, you know, they, they can pronounce it, you know, so, which, which is, which is great. So suck it, Saka. Um, that's, that's one, suck I think it, I, who, who was on a couple of weeks ago and, uh, they, they coined the term, uh, Saka bitches. Oh, uh, um, that was, uh, um, Saka from, bitches. Uh, yeah, uh, it was, uh, uh, John, uh, John Carney from, uh, LFD and he oh, went God. off on one of Saka bitches, you know? So, so th- that was it. So the, the next, that might catch on. So we're uh, we're, Saka. (laughs) Yes. Hashtag Saka bitches. Um, So since we're talking about Saka, 
we, we've, we've got we've got you. You guys were uh, were, were, were partners there uh, uh, in, in True Estate. Um, who? So I, I hear on both sides. <laughs> so- Saka created the Liga Privada T52, and I tell people, no, Nick Melillo created the the, the T52. So who was who was the person that created the Liga Privada T52? So let, let, let me make this this statement very clear. I, I would love. Have you asked Saka this question? I have not asked Saka oh, this I, question. I, I, so I, I want to make this statement first. People don't realize Steve and I are are really good friends, <laughs> yes. and all of this ha- has been a plan that we've been working on <laughs> to trick the whole market to sell more cigars, <laughs> and everybody's falling for the bait. Um, you know. Steve, I would make this statement. Liga Pro- Pravada wouldn't exist without either of us. And also an amazing team at the factory. Um, you know, he came on board end of 2005, you know, beginning of 2006. When I had gotten down here in 2003, I didn't smoke infused cigars. Yeah, I was a Padron 3000 sm- smoker. I smoked a lot of Fuentes, you know, I smoked a lot of, at that time, there was a lot of Broadleaf Excaliburs, believe it or not, you know, Punch, <laughs> Boy, I mean, it was, a, it was a different, different scene at the time. So I immediately in 2003 started learning how to roll blend, like that was, I was 24, you know, I was now in heaven learning from people I've only read about and learned about. So I had been blending for almost three years before Steve had come on board and Steve came on board. And I remember the phone call, send me something I can effing smoke. (laughs) Okay. At that time, Oliva Tampa, Oliva tobacco, not the cigar family, but the tobacco family was curing Connecticut broadleaf here. And they, you know, they had been curing broadleaf for a long time. And they had been working with a legend called Frank Ionessa, who made a lot of the Hoya and Punch, um, you know, broadleaf stuff. He's one of my idols when it comes to, to broadleaf. So I took all of those blends I had been working on for years and made up 10 blends. And Steve and I would be the ones smoking. And we, we have very similar flavor profiles and likes um, and smoke those blends. And Steve took to one of them uh, very quickly and developed, you know, Liga 9 around it. I had nothing to do with the development of the brand at all. My job was always tobacco side yeah. and blending, Not you know. So the – T-52 was actually a trip that we made to Connecticut. And it was me, Steve, and John at the time happened to be all on this trip. And one of the farmer's sons had been, we walked into a barn and there was this strange leaf that didn't look like broadleaf. And it was Havana seed curing for the barn. So we ended up purchasing it. We ended up committing to like 10,000 pounds of it. Oh, wow. First year of fermentation, not burning. Second year of fermentation, not burning. We thought we were, we thought we were screwed. We thought we had, you know, perch. It just was not turning and it didn't turn into the third year. And then that leaf was used around the original Liga Pravada blend. Okay. okay. So, so, all right. So, just to throw it out there, it was all Nick. Um, <laughs> just throw, throw it out there. So, so, talk, so, talking about the Liga 9, so uh, um, at the Great Smoke, someone wanted me to ask you about the Liga 9s that were supposedly fermented in a Pappy Van Winkle barrel. Oh, were, God. Were, were those, was that true? And what happened to those oh, cigars? God. Okay. So I had had a, there had been a trip down to Nicaragua for Cigar Safari with, uh, you know, it was a Tennessee and Kentucky trip. 
and one of the sales reps was down here and they, one of the clients ended up sending the sales rep, who's a good friend of mine, a gift basket. Within that gift basket was a bottle of, I think it was 20, 23, I forgot. This has got to be like 2009, 2010 of Pappy Van Winkle. I'd never heard of it, never seen the bottle. Of course, I was instantly attracted to it because of this gentleman on the, on the bottle smoking yeah. a Presidente. And the rep gave it to me. And I said, oh, man, this, is, <laughs> this bottle is awesome. Pappy Van Winkle, this name is so cool. Um, and then I would, you know, when I go to the States from time to time, I would find old Rip Van Winkle for like 30 bucks. And I, you know, I found another bottle of the 20 year for like, you know, a hundred bucks. So I'm in Nicaragua one afternoon. I was like, Pappy Van Winkle, let me look them up on the internet. Oh, there's a phone number. Let me call them up. I call cold call Pappy Van Winkle. I talked to this guy for like a half an hour. Sir, I didn't catch your name. Who do I have the, uh, the privilege of speaking of? My name, Julian Van Winkle. Oh, Mr. Van Winkle, it's a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, Thanksgiving was coming up. I said, I'm going to send you some cigars for Thanksgiving. I hope you enjoy them. I sent him L40s. I sent him a box of T52s. I sent him an ashtray couple weeks after Thanksgiving, I get a phone call. Nicholas, these the cigars were a big hit at, at Thanksgiving. My whole family loved them. What can I do for you? Tell me anything and I, I'll do anything for you. I said, Mr. Van Winkle, I would love to cure tobacco in some of your 20-year-old barrels. You got it. I got you. I get a call about 10 minutes later. We had, uh, it was two 20-year barrels and two Buffalo Trace barrels that were prepped by Julian Van Winkle, and I had them shipped to Nicaragua. Oh, man. And I shipped them and had them hidden in the back of the factory um, and was curing Liga Pravada fillers in these barrels, of which I made a very small amount of... Um, Liga Pravada, double Coronas, um, and some Toros. There's one video online of like a uh, one of the BOTL, I think, groups. And it's actually me, Steve, and John were on this trip. And I they didn't really even know about them. And I was showing them in the video. It's somewhere online. I, I've seen it. Um, oh, man. And I'm showing them where I have it hidden in, um, in the back. And so from there, I end, you know, I ended up leaving and, you know, the rest is, is history. Um, they ended up developing the Pappy Van Winkle cigar and everything. I, I don't know what they ended up using or, you know, what, what they yeah. ended up doing, but, um, uh, I would, I, I don't, I don't know if there's still sparrows are still, so there. so sure so I, I I'll have to ask Sam. Sam Morales came in after you guys, after you and Steve. Yeah, Sa Sammy would know what happened to those barrels. Well, no, I can I can actually ask the uh, I I mean yeah my my uh, one of my uh, friends st is still the GM. Oh the okay, factory, so yeah yeah I'll ask him. It's it's it. it's in somebody's office as like a desk yeah. or something. It was it yeah. was in the back, you know, where our loading dock was and where they I know they moved, you know, the factory has been totally added onto and and changed. So it would be crazy if they still had them back there. Oh, oh awesome. that that would be crazy. So yeah. so uh next question is from me. Um you, you obviously know John Foster, you know, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so John Foster was telling me He's, a story. He, he actually just texted me. He's here in Nicaragua. Oh, is he? Yeah. Oh, what, what's, I've been what's, trying to get him to come down here forever. Oh, so what's John yeah. doing down down there? Just visiting? I think he's he's visiting some customers and whatnot. Yeah. Okay, so John told me about a a story once where he woke up like in the middle of the night. It's like two o'clock in the morning, 
and you're out in the middle of the tobacco field, just touching the tobacco, just looking, you know, just being, you know, and it's a great story, you know, talking about your dedication to tobacco, you know, is that something that you do? Is that, is that story true or that you just, you listen, sometimes, sometimes we'll go out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we can go out. It depends, you know, especially if tobacco, you, you got to understand when tobacco is in the growing process and in the curing barns, the, there's no, there, there's a lot of responsibility, man. You know what I mean? You, you, you have something very fragile, People don't understand it. You know, they see me pictures in the fields or in fermentation piles. And they're like, oh, that's the coolest job. You, you have no idea how much stress is involved. Well, yeah, in because that, you this whole because, process. Because you have pictures, you're stretching the leaves. Mm -hmm. Then we got the videos of the guys, you know, the polones, they're beating the shit out of tobacco. And then we yeah. hear you say, Oh, it's so fragile. Well, these guys have yeah. piles and they're beating it against well, you. Well, no, I mean I well, yeah. I yeah, mean it yeah. could be especially the heavier stuff, but fragile in the sense that the wrong conditions. Oh, okay. You okay. know, in the curing barns, in the you know, that process is especially when it comes out of the field. Sorry, there's Somebody announcing a, uh, I think it's a funeral. This is how people kind of learn about um, okay. uh, funerals and stuff like that. Sorry. Um, so, you know, in the curing barns, when it's coming out of the fields, if you can mess things up really easily, really quickly, if you're not on top of the whole process, I mean, this okay. is going to be crazy. <laughs> so, so, so is is the is the tobacco yeah. telling you know? I, is the tobacco telling you something? Like Always, at, at, at like night when you're in there, not during the day. Good you know, thing what, it's what, not like terrorizing me all the time. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I mean, you have to be able to observe and listen. I mean, this is the best tobacco people, right? Because if you're coming in with preconceived conditions or you know, just because it's in your mind or you have a narrative and you're not being observing and you're not listening to the conditions, that's when things can go awry. Um, so you have to be very attentive. You know, luckily right now, I'm not in the position where I have all of that responsibility on me because of the partners I'm working with. But before, you know, all of Drew Estate production quality control, fermentation, that all went through my hands. You know, I, that was the, I was the, any quality control issues, tobacco and fermentation. You know, I remember, you know, early on with, you know, T52, if you have a bad sort, you know, say you have a bad sort where you're taking thicker leaves and they're not sorted properly and you don't have all the thick leaves together with the thin leaves. If you got thick and thin leaves mixed together and then they go through fermentation, what's going to happen? The thinner leaves are going to cure faster than the thick leaves. Yeah. Okay. Now they're all together. So say you're reviewing leaf and you're like, oh, this is, this is done. It's burning. But they're all mixed together. Then those get passed to the production floor. You're going to have some cigars burning and the other ones are going to be all fucked up. They're not going to have the right. That's a simple thing, but that's a huge thing. And proper selection and sorting of tobacco. Huge. If you're not dialed in with that, that can happen pretty easy. If yeah, your I, people are not yeah. on the same page, you know what I mean? Like th that can happen pretty easy. If you got people in the curing barn that don't know what they're doing, you got temperatures set too high, you got temperatures set too low. And that's happening at night. That doesn't stop, right? Yeah. So sometimes you go check the barns at 2 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes you go check. So, you know so, what I mean? Uh, that's it. So, so, so my final question before we let you go for tonight. Um, what, what, what did your time spent at Drew Estate with, with Saka, you know, um, what, what, did, what and, and even, and even you you obviously you guys are still friends. You still, you still talk. What, what does, What's one lesson about tobacco or even about life that Saka has taught you that you still, that you still take away that every day? Like, like what, what, what is a Saka-ism? <laughs> Listen, um, 
so from just a work perspective, working with Steve, I really enjoyed because of his attention to detail in organization. So, you know, running a factory, you, again, things can go awry really fast. So being able to have the proper communication is, is crucial. So working with him, you know, getting emails responded to on a timely basis, having clarity in communication. I mean, that's, that, that's crucial to an organization and especially, you know, a production or is clarity. And, and that's one thing, if anybody knows Steve, that you get <laughs> is clarity. And, that, yeah. and, and when it comes to, to making handmade cigars, I mean, that's crucial. Um, and then also, you know, his commitment to quality um, and not lowering that standard or, you know, that bar. I definitely, you know, learned working w- with Steve or also committed to that. Uh, which was, again, also refreshing. That's why the combination of both of us working together, um, I think, produced some of the, the most amazing cigars that this industry ever produced. That's a big statement, but I don't think, I think the cigars we were doing together at that time with the team down here was making some of the the, the best cigars that the industry has ever seen. That's a big statement, but it, 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 that's it's, the reality. It's true what what you guys yeah. were doing, you know, together, and what you guys have done separately. You know, yeah. hand, hands down, you know, some of the best, and I would, and I would say the most consistent cigars in the industry. You know, is, yeah. is, is Foundation and Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust. You know, two because we're both consistent. lunatics, and yeah. we we uh, we understand that from the perspective of being cigar smokers. Right. We, I am yeah. at the end of the day, I'm a cigar smoker. So I know more than I think anyone, because in, in the sense of I smoke cigars and I'm not saying I more, know more than anybody, but in that sense, I am the, the customer, you know, I, 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 I was there. So I think I have an intimate relationship with the market in that sense, which a lot of times some people don't have the luxury of, of having, and, you know, some people are down here or maybe sometimes people are in, you know, come from Cuba. They haven't been exposed to the market. You know, I, I was lucky. I got to start in a, working a cigar shop is understanding, you know, the market and what was going on in the U S market. If you don't have that experience, it's tough sometimes to understand, you know, um, also flavor profiles and blends, right. Um, U S probably has different flavor profiles than say the European market or, or other places um, on the earth. So I've been lucky to have perspective and then to be able to come down here and, you know, learn from some of the best in the world. I was able to pick up, you know, a lot of different elements from, from different people. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going off on tangents. No, no, that's okay. And and I would yeah. say you definitely know more than Steve Saka does because you have a candela and he refuses to work with it. So that in my book tells me you are a better cigar blender than Steve I Saka. I don't know about that. I, I mean, I mean, candela's for off, man. Candela's tough to work with, but I I do it, you know. Oh, for the for the upsetters, but then also I have my. I do one called yeah, the, the, gra- the grasshopper. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so you have one. Steve doesn't. That's one for Nick Melillo. Zero for Saka. You know. So oh, I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. So I don't know, but he worked with melons or something like that. I, yeah, I yeah, 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 yeah. Cultivo Tonto is what he calls it. You know, <laughs> you know got, got that from the Japanese uh, square watermelons or whatever. I, I forget what the story. Goes. Japanese do it right. That, that, I do have to say, Quentin, right? <laughs> Kevin is that okay? So, a, I have never talked this less on a show before, and and our and this is the single longest running show that we've ever had. At, Crazy at, at two forty five. Oh, so, we're on two forty five. Holy cow! Got well, 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 we were we were ninety minutes in before we got to cigars. So yeah, uh, yeah so we, that's true. We, we had to make up some time somewhere. So Nick, thank you 
so much. It's a uh, um, God. I, 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 you know, I always love chatting with you. you know? Same here. This has been fun, man. I've enjoyed this very yeah. much. I, I, yeah. I, I, I've had a blast. So uh, if you, you see got John- good questions, yes. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, if you see John Foster, if you get a meet up with him, tell him I said hi. You yeah, know, I'm uh, supposed to see this nut uh, soon. John and I met in the, actually in Nicaragua. Um, you know. It goes back to the story I was telling there about uh, the Olivas um, yeah. working with Broadleaf. They were working with John. Oh, okay. That was, yeah, that was 2003, 2004. And I happened to be walking through this gigantic warehouse of tobacco. I can't remember why I was alone. And then out of the blue comes this other gringo, and he's alone. <laughs> And we meet in the middle of this warehouse and I go, Hey man, what's going on? What are you doing? Where are you from? She's like, Connecticut. I was like, what? I'm from <laughs> Connecticut. And that was our first meeting. Wow. Just uh, yeah. w- w- weird. So, uh, uh, and I'm definitely going to reach out to Fabian and I uh, give him a, a lashing for yeah. making, <laughs> but making you need him- to have him tell that story about, uh, what's his name from star Wars. It's a yeah. crazy story. Yeah, if you're so, a star yeah. Wars fan, it might, it might disturb you a little. Okay. <laughs> it's a great story, though. I'm, I'm going to reach out, even if we just do like a 15 minute interview with him. I'm 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 going to get him Fabian on on, and we're going to do it because that's the only him. way he made me tell the horse story. Is <laughs> I have made him tell his Star Wars story because I loved it so much. Oh, right on. So thank you so much, man. Thank all right, guys. Yeah, thanks to you guys and to your, to all the viewers, and uh, I hope we can do this again. Definitely send me your address. Oh, Give definitely will do, time. man. But so, all yeah, right, man. Definitely do that. You have a good night down there. All right, guys. All right. See, See all right, ya. Be safe. All right. Peace. Peace. All right, everybody. Start typing in the word cigar, um, and then uh, we'll. In the meantime, we'll hear a word from our sponsor, Corona Cigar. All right. What an absolutely fantastic show. Um, I can't believe it's been almost three hours. Um, just, uh, I, I love chatting with Nick. I love every time I see him anywhere, we always talk. And then it, it's usually like this show. It's never about cigars. It's always just, you know, history culture. So, um, um, thank you, Nick, for coming on. And uh, you, you better believe we're, we're getting that story from Fabian. I'm reaching out to him tomorrow, <laughs> and then uh, we're going to get him to. We have uh, to have to, him do, if he's not on the show, we have to have him, like, actually do, like, a video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to do, like, a video interview, like, and then we'll just have to post that. So um, let's uh, um, let's right, share let's share my screen, and it's time for the, uh, oh, let's uh, let's get that, the, uh, uh, the Tapping Ash and uh, uh, Taking Names giveaway presented by Amendola Family Cigars. Let me see if I can share the screen here. Um, why is it not uh, coming up? Okay, there we go. So, all right, let's start collecting comments. 27. Let me just get my list of people that cannot win just to make sure that they're not uh, on there. So, uh, no, uh, NLEDJ. K-N-E-S, so definitely sh- uh, shoot me an email, Kevin at uh, CigarProp.com. Uh, the winner tonight gets a, uh, uh, a hat uh, from our fine uh, partners at Illusione Cigars. And the March 2023 um, uh, Corona Premium Cigar of the Month Club shipment includes a Drew Estate FSG, a La Aurora, El Septimo Alexander the three, uh, third Bandolero, and a Corona Cigar Constantine, uh, a crazy amount of uh, great cigars. Um, let's see next week we welcome, this is where care comes in handy. Uh, we've got the, uh, the, the, the founder of uh, Charlotte cigar week, uh, that'll be coming from the show for the life of me. I did not uh, write down his name. So I don't remember uh, the gentleman's name from Charlotte cigar week. So we'll be talking with him all about that event coming up. 
I'll be going up for a couple of days, joining care um, up there. Uh, make sure you're following Cigar Prop, Producer Jerska, Care Viajante of Stogie Road Cigars, Nick Malillo, Foundation Cigars. Um, all the links are in the social media, uh, or all the social media links are in the video description below. Podcast description if you're listening to this in the future. Um, also, uh, make sure. I, I just want to uh, say that that's my birthday when you're going to be gone. Oh, is it? <laughs> yes. Well, you had a great birthday last year, so um, <laughs> um, I, I hooked you up with the Edgar Allan Poe thing. So I'm going to miss this one. Okay. Um, so remember uh, in the, uh, the the video description below. Uh, the Boston Jimmy uh, climbing Mount Fuji for Autism Speak. That's in the uh, the description. Also, Matt and Nicole from uh, Smoke and Tobacco hosting their uh, third annual raffle for the Cigar Family Charitable Foundation. If you want to get in on that and get some great raffle prizes, um, check uh, check out that uh, as well. Uh, thank you, J.C. Newman Cigars, Cigar Medics, Amendola Cigars. We are the muscle. Jake Wyatt Cigars, Illusione Cigars, Deep in Flavor, Deep in Your Mind, K by Karen Burger Cigars, Corona Cigar, and of course, Drew Estate and Experience Acid.